Good morning to all the dignitaries, respected principals, professors, supporting staff, and to all my dear friends. I am Ms. Vijay Rodriguez with great joy and exultation feel privileged to extend my warm welcome on behalf of our Wilson College to all present here. Today as we all are gathered here for our today's program, I would like to take this opportunity to begin the program by introducing our respected principal, Professor Anna Pratima Nikolje. Professor Anna Pratima Nikolje has completed her MSc and PhD in chemistry and also her postgraduate diploma in IPR law. She is appointed as the first woman secretary of John Wilson Education Society. She is also the secretary of Board of Management, Wilson College. Ma'am has published eight international books and 128 research papers in reputed international journals and has been granted two patents by Government of India on anti-cancer drug research and anti-epileptic drugs. She is also the reviewer and editorial board member of many reputed international journals. Ma'am has accomplished great success in her career and has been awarded with many noteworthy awards like Bharat Ratna Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Award 2022 for her excellent work and contribution to the society. The Professor Indira Parikh Women in Education Leaders Award by the World Education Congress. Association of Chemistry Teacher Professor P.B. Punjabi Award for her outstanding contribution to research in chemical sciences for 2021. Devang Mehta National Education Award for Women in Education Leadership Community Leader Award 2019 CASI Government of Maharashtra. Erasmus Spain Research Excellence Award at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain in 2014. The Dr. R. D. Patel National Best Innovative Research Guide Award for the year 2011-2012. Dr. P. D. Seti Best Research Paper on HPDLC Annual Certificate of Merit Award for the year 2009-2010 an award for five research papers in 2012. She has also been awarded with the Best Paper Presentation Award in 2005, 2009, 2010 and in 2011. She has received a scholarship of 500 euros at the International Symposium, HPLC, in 2007, Belgium. She also received a travel grant from INSA and Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Maratwada University for attending International Symposium at Belgium in 2007. <coughs> Professor Anna Pratima Nikolje was a trainer of teachers and resource person for sensitization awareness and motivation program of UGC's capacity building of women managers in higher education 2012. She has done a major research project of UGC in 2010 of 9 lakhs and a minor research project in 2007. The previous responsibilities handled by her are Vice Principal Head of Department, Academic in Charge, Exam in Charge, Student Council in Charge, ICC in Charge, IQAC, anti ragging Research and IPR, and CDC member. She is a professional member of the American, Chem American Chemical Society, Indian Science Congress Association, Association of Chemistry Teachers of India, TWAS, FENS and WIFE. She is a recipient of gold medals and six other awards as, the, as a university topper and she is the editorial board member of GP Globalized Research Journal of Chemistry. Ma'am, we are extremely proud and blessed to have you as our principal. Now I would like to, re now I would like to request uh, Professor Anna Ma'am to give her introductory remark. Good morning everyone, dear students, teachers, a warm welcome to all the scientists and participants to Autonomous Wilson College, an institution that rests on a strong academic foundation of 
189 years, blended with a modern approach that seeks to mold learners into successful world leaders. Leading the college since 25th September 2018, I feel privileged to see a vibrant college that offers extensive opportunities while retaining its ethos, culture and compassionate approach. I feel a sense of pride in sharing with you all that the hard work put in by the science departments during pandemic in preparing and submitting the proposal to the Department of Biotechnology, DBT, Government of India under DBT Star College program was rewarded by the expert committee who recommended it for a grant of fortune of 1 crore and shortly we will receive the grants. The most important, the most important post-pandemic achievement has been fulfillment of the dream of autonomy for the institution. To match the demands of modern education and holistic development of learners, Wilson College had been planning to go for autonomy over the last few years. With immense joy and satisfaction, I share with you that this dream has been realized in October 2021. Trading consciously with a long-term vision of excellence, the entire Wilson team stepped into autonomy with effect from the current academic year 2022-23. We at Wilson believe in nurturing scientific temperament which culminated in the success of our students at university level event Avishkar for the first time in the last academic year. They received second prize in undergraduates category and consolation prize in postgraduate category. On the research front, the college has been progressing steadily. 16 staff members who were awarded minor research projects from Mumbai University PCU have completed and submitted the same in spite of pandemic and more teachers have been recognized as research guides for PhD uh, degrees. The vision and mission of the college is reflected in providing intellectually challenging environment that will empower students to become multifaceted individuals as inventive thinkers, resourceful problem solvers and motivated learners prepared to flourish in the 21st century. Therefore, this lecture series by BARC scientists during this Azadika Amrut Mahotsav has been conceptualized, focusing mainly on career opportunities in the basic sciences. It is my belief that the participants will get in-depth knowledge and guidance from the professionals who are working in the cutting-edge technologies and scientific knowledge. There is a need for innovation which can be achieved when we think and act in the right direction. I once again thank and welcome BARC community for their valuable time and efforts taken to mentor our students. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful words. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Dimple Datta, Scientific Officer Level G in Chemistry Division, BARC. Dr. Dimple P. Datta, joined BARC in 1996 after completing her post-graduation in chemistry from IIT Kanpur, India. She did her post-doctoral fellowship at University of Heidelberg, Germany. Currently, she is a senior scientist in BARC and professor at Homi Baba National Institute, Mumbai, India. Her major area of research is in the field of functional materials for energy storage and environmental applications. Dr. Datta has an impressive list of research publications to her credit, written several book chapters and has presented her reverse reserve work at several international forums. She is a recipient of several awards for her seminal contribution in the field of chemical sciences, which includes the prestigious bronze medal from CR CRSI, that is Chemical Research Society of India, DAE Scientific and Technical Excellence Awards and DAE SSPS Young Achiever Award. She is a Fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and Member of National Academy of Sciences India. She is also a recipient of ACS Award 
from the American Chemical Society. Dr. Datta also serves as a reviewer for more than 30 journals of international repute and is an associate editor for International Journal of Applied Ceramics Technology. Now I request Dr. Dimple Datta to give us an introduction on Department of Atomic Energy. Uh, 
So about, and then we have several public sector undertakings, as you can see over here. You have Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited, you have Indian Rare Earths Limited, and also you have Uranium Corporation of India and Electronic Corporation of India, where all the instrumentation part of the various nuclear technologies which are in there in force, all the instrumentation takes part, uh, it takes place in ECIN. Apart from that, we have various industrial organizations, service organizations, and board of research in nuclear sciences, and we also have Homi Bhava National Institute. So all this constitute the mammoth organization, which is the Department of Atomic Energy. So you can see the atomic energy uh, establishments in India. It is like present all throughout the country and with important benefits for national economy and national security. So it has been a model demonstration of the systematic application of advanced science and technology to the task of nation building and national development. So what are the achievements of DAE? First is the design, construction and operation of nuclear power and research reactors and the development of supporting nuclear fuel cycle technologies. So we have 22 nuclear reactors currently operating in the country and mind it, most of the technology what we have is indigenous. Our scientists have developed all these technologies. So this is a, most, a, a very important thing, something to be really proud of because we were denied nuclear power technologies for various reasons as you're all aware of and our scientists took up the challenge and now we have a very thriving nuclear power program running in the country which has been completely brought up almost indigenously. So that's a really a very big point of achievement in the 75 years. And then not only nuclear power technologies, development of several other advanced technologies like accelerators, lasers, supercomputers, advanced materials, instrumentation, name it, our scientists are doing it all indigenously. Then we have development of radiation technologies and their applications for better crop varieties, crop protection, post-harvest storage. So all these are basically the societal applications in which DA is working on and this contributes to the food security of the country. Then we have a lot on cancer research which is happening, techniques for radio diagnosis, radiotherapy of diseases. Then we have technologies for safe drinking water, better environment, industrial growth. So this is where our membrane divisions people, they are working. A lot of membranes are being developed. Technologies are being transferred to small scale units and this is being done for the support of the you know, lower income generation and also for uh, contributing to water security in the country. Then cutting it, basic research activities for strengthening scientific and technological prowess of the nation. This is very important. A lot of basic research, as I said, BRC is not only about nuclear power, BRC as well as DAE encompasses a lot and lot of different research areas in which various number of scientists are working. So it is a hotbed of interdisciplinary research. And then you have international cooperation in related advanced areas of research. Like all the big projects, name it, ITER project, LEGO project, all this about which my colleagues will be talking to you later, you will find that scientists from our organization are being deputed to go and contribute their scientific knowledge to all these major international collaboration projects which are running all over the world globally. Now coming from coming to HBNI, that is Homi Baba National Institute. So here, uh, this is basically a deemed to be university under the aegis of DAE. And uh, this was started in 2005, and this is a grant in aid institute, and we, it brings together the academic programs of 11 premier institutions of DAE, four R&D institutes which I have already discussed to you about, and also we have grant in aid institutions, as I have listed over here. You can see it is Indian Institute, uh, Institute for Plasma Research, which is at Gandhinagar, then SINP Kolkata, then Tata Memorial Center at Mumbai. Institute for Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. Then we have HRI, which is Harish Chandra Research Institute at Allahabad. Then Institute of Physics at Bhubaneswar and also National Institute of Science, Education and Research, Bhubaneswar. So you can see the number of grant in, grant in aid institutions which are there under the aegis of DA or HBNI. Now there are, you can see the presence of these HBNI campuses. It is there almost all over India. So the objectives of HBNI has been to encourage pursuit of excellence in indigenous nuclear science and technology, covering complete range of nuclear technologies based on all indigenous efforts, and to provide an academic framework for integrating basic research with technology through interdisciplinary research, 
attract and nurture high quality manpower and make available excellent faculty pool and the strong infrastructure at DAE to outside students. As you will find, there are a lot of opportunities in which you can get research internships at DAE, at diff different of these various of these DAE institutes, and you can hone your research skills by collaborating with people, which my uh, esteemed colleagues will be discussing with you later. The mission of HBNI is obviously to facilitate the development of nuclear energy and other mission programs. And the content of the course, the topic of research, they are all designed to create human resources to address science and technology, which is of direct relevance to DAE. But as I said, DAE encompasses many different disciplines, so you can work on most of the fields you can think of. So thus, the mission of HBNI, as you can see, is closely intertwined with the mission of the department. So we have, at present, 45 academic programs running, a lot of PhD students working, and we have a few unique programs. Rather than having master's program in only organic, physical, and inorganic, you will find several master's programs offered in HBNI, which are particularly job-oriented, like in medical and radiological physics, in patient navigation, in hospital radiopharmacy, in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging technology, and also public health epidemiology. Apart from that, we also have an integrated pro program which is under medical and health sciences. So this is a gamut of things you can do at the Department of Atomic Energy. So for today's program, what we have lined up is a nice talk about career opportunities in basic sciences. If you have taken basic science, then what are the different career opportunities available? And then followed by that, we have individual talks and in different subjects, you know, individually, what thing you can do in chemistry, in physics, in biology, and also a few frontier areas of chemistry, physics, and biology in which research currently is being uh, continuing, and you have a lot of, uh, you know, things to achieve in those particular areas. And followed by that, we have a very exciting quiz and prize-winning session, which I think will keep all of you booked to all the lectures, but I am sure that you will enjoy that session with us. So all my team members who are here today to help me and uh, also to bring forward all the things our department has to offer to you. And as I say that initially the slogan was Jai Jawan and Jai Kisan, but as we move into Amritkal now, the slogan has changed to Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, Jai Vigyan and Jai Right. And that Jai Sandan is looking like you didn't have breakfast in the morning. <laughs> So can I have a louder Jai Anusandhan? Jai Anusandhan. Yes, that's right. So now let's start. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your encouraging and enlightening words. Now, I would like to call upon Ms. Disha to introduce our next resource person, Dr. Sandeep Nigam, who is a Scientific Officer Level G in Chemistry Division of BARC. Thank you. Thank you, Vichol. I am Disha Biswas from BSc Microbiology, and now I would like to introduce our next resource person, Dr. Sandeep Nigam. He is a scientific officer of Level G in the Chemistry Division at Bhava Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. Dr. Sandeep Nigam did his MSc from Rajasthan University, Jaipur, and later joined Chemistry Division, Bhava Atomic Research Center in 2003 after graduating from 46th batch of BARC training school. Since then, he has been actively involved in the field of cluster science, nanomaterials and their energy applications. He was awarded the PhD degree from Mumbai University in year 2008 for his international and theoretical work on pure and mixed clusters. He has worked as a visiting scientist at Physics Department, Michigan Technological University, Houghton, USA. He has published around 19 articles in international referee journals with 1,205 citations and H index 20 on Google Scholar Citation. He is a recognized PhD guide on, of Homi Bhabha National Institute and Mumbai University. He also serves as a visiting faculty at UAM DAE Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. We are extremely pleased 
and fortunate to have you here, sir. I would now request you to address this session and enlighten us with the career opportunities in basic sciences. So I will be covering the career opportunities in basic science. When I mean basic science, means all three branches: uh, physics, chemistry, biology. Okay. So when somebody talks about career, what is mean by career? Generally, career is what we do for living. Okay. Any action or progress that takes through his or her life, especially with related to the occupations. So it is very important to take the right decision for the career. Okay, so when we have said that career is for the life or living, so what is the basic requirement of life? Basic requirement of life is food to eat, clothes to wear and shelter to live. Basically, roti, kapda and makar. But in today's world, this life itself is not sufficient. Generally, we talk about lifestyle or standard of living. So, in addition to the basic requirement of life, you require automation in your life. Hence, how many gadgets you are using in your day-to-day -day life. Is it or not? We use so many gadgets. Okay. When it comes to health, you require, you want to be fit always and you have want to have best of the medical facilities along with you. And of course you want to have a leisure time for entertainment, vacation, travel, sports and other things. And that counts, accounts for standard of living. If you see closely both basic requirement of life as well as the requirement for the lifestyle, both require significant amount of scientific knowledge. So it is obvious that science is playing a major role as well as in the fulfilling the basic requirement of the life and towards the lifestyle. So it is obvious that there will be large number of opportunities if you are pursuing science as a career. Is it or not? So when we talk about career, science career, not only the quality of the opportunity, it is the number of opportunities also are very large. The best aspect of study of having career in science that any time you can move to other occupants, just hard arts, immunities, uh, immunities and other business. Vice versa, transition is not allowed. Is it or not? So any time you can switch. So today what I have done, I have after 12, when somebody is passing from 12 or high school, he has generally, in general, he has three major options available to his or her. Okay, one is either he can go for medical via NEET exam or any contemporary exam or towards engineering or third option which we have the central option pursue with the basic science. So here whatever I am presenting today is pertaining to this basic science part means if you are doing a BSc and MSc and in basic science part also I have divided in further two subsections which is called academics and another is industry. So you can have career in academy as well as in industry. So when you talk about academic career, it can be further divided into two subsections that is teaching or education or you can go for a research kind of career. Okay. So when you talk about teaching or education after BSc, of course you have a chance that you can do the PhD and you can join as a TGT teacher at any school. Okay, if you have done MSc, you have a chance to do the beard and then join as a PGT teacher. And of course there are, sorry, so on research part, after BSc, you can do the MSc. In addition to the regular MSc, there is another term called MSc by research in which you have to submit a thesis and then you can do the MSc. And of course, after MSc, you can do like a diploma in radiological physics at DAE. There is, you can do the PhD for that. Doing the PhD, 
you can have various doctoral fellowship you can qualify the net exam and you can have uh, fellowship junior research fellowship then subsequently senior research fellowship or shama prashad mukherjee fellowship different bodies like CGS, CSIR, UGC, DBT, DST and our own departments gives these kind of fellowships. And after PhD you have subsequently further different kind of fellowships like Nehru Postdoc Fellowships, Women Scientist Scheme, DST Inspire Fellowships, Marie Curie, Humboldt and so many other fellowships. And if you are interested in joining as a permanent position you have the option of joining in a government bodies as a scientific assistant after BSc and after MSc as a scientific officer. After BSc to MSc, if somebody is interested to having a more improved quality MSc with a research component, they are at a premier institutes that in India various premier institutes like TIFR, JNCSR, ISC Bangalore, they conduct their own exam for the entrance in MSc. And this is, I have listed few of those exams like graduate at school admission conducted by TIFR Mumbai, IIT, NIT conducts JAM, ISER, Indian Institute of Scientific Science and Educational Research, they conduct their own exam. And of course, something like similar ISC Bangalore and JNCSR, they are also conduct their exam. Within BSc or MSc, if you are trying to have a flavor of the research, then you can do an internship within BSc or MSc. So these there are three academies of science in India. They offer the fellowship for doing the internship. You can go to the website of these three academics. And of course, in DAE, our, we ourselves also provide opportunity to the in, uh, internship at our institute. Dr. Datta has already specifically mentioned that we provide, provide the unique uh, MSc at our institute, HBNI. MSc in uh, something like clinical research or uh, in molecular imaging technology. So here I have just mention what are the employment options. You can join as a pharmaceutical industries, biotechnology, medical science devices companies, faculty and trained manpower in nuclear medicine centers. So these are the specific jobs for the those specific MSCs. If you do MSc in hospital radio pharmacy, you can join as a radio pharmacist at uh, different places. If you do MSc in public health and epidemiology, you have the different uh, options available in public health analyst uh, as a public health analyst or health service researchers and so on. So after MSc, it is advisable that you do the, in, to uh, brighten your chances of career. You can do the PhD. Right? Yeah, okay. So there are these are the list of the institute like IITs, NITs, ISER, ISERS, DRDO lab, CSR lab, DBT, DAE, IASC that is a space organization, then IACS Kolkata, IASC Bangalore, JNCR, all these premier institutes provides quality PhD to science grad post graduates. Okay, other than this, you have UGC recognized almost thousand universities in India. So you have the option in more, almost more than 1000 institutes to do the PhD. We also provide lots of opportunity to do the doctoral and postdoctoral research. Other than HBNI, which Dr. Dutta has already discussed, we have two other institutes, TIFR, UGC, CSR, and third one is University of Mumbai DAE Center of Excellence in Basic Science. So one can join as uh, PhD program or research associate at there also. If you are interested to join a DAE as a permanent faculty or a permanent position, we have three channels, three specific channels. One is BSc, that is you can join us as a after as a category one trainee and then you will be absorbed after training. Then prestigious OCS program that is conducted every year. In January, the in generally in general in January the advertisement comes in the newspaper and then subsequently the person has to undergo the training and then he will be absorbed as scientific officer C in the department. And after PhD you can join through case care research uh, associateship program. Uh, we have direct recruitment via open advertisements also. Not only DA, other government bodies also offer the permanent positions. 
in which basically GSI, DRDO, CSIR or other UPSC regularly recruit science graduates and post graduates. And of course you have the other universities, more than 1000 universities available to you to join as lecturer or assistant professors. If you come to industries, if you see food industry, agriculture, oil, petroleum, all these requires, all these listed universities, this list is exhaustive, you know you are using lots of gadgets, they use semiconductors, so semiconductor industry requires lots of science graduates, postgraduates and PhDs, energy, battery, power, seed and nursery, wildlife, fishery department, uh, geological survey department, forest services, waste water plant, all these are, I have just narrated to that these industries are always looking for science graduates and postgraduates. In industry, government sector also recruits science graduates, postgraduates and PhDs. In particular, if we name ONGC, Gale, ECIL, which is a DA uh, organization, and of course NPCL, that is Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited. In private sector, there is lots of uh, industries are there, which regularly recruits. I have just put in the representative examples. And of course, the latest trend, anywhere you go, the importance of data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing are there. Even if you do are doing a purchasing or a shopping, if you do on, go on Amazon, it automatically fills whatever the requirement, that is machine learning. So it is in every part of your life. And you know, with this, you have large number of opportunities. And of course, government of India is ready to fund your ideas using in form of startups. And Government of India is indeed interested in funding the scientific, different scientific research. Just a typical example, in the Union Budget 2020, Government of India put it rupees 8,000 crores in quantum computing missions. Okay, so physics and chemistry and all scientific person has good opportunities in this era. Okay, the hydrogen mission which Prime Minister have declared in last year's Independence Day speech. So there are large number of opportunities in India because government of India itself is investing large amount of money in the scientific uh, uh, community. So just to put the power of the Indian science, I will use couple of slides and then I will conclude that what science has given, the Indian science has given to our country. Before that, this is just from DAE side, there are different technologies are available uh, for technology transfer and they are also can be used to start up and make in India. But perfect example is Bhabha Kavach and carbon nanotubes related research uh, which has been used and even technology has been transferred and Bhabha Kavach has been provided to the, our security persons. And so here is the power of Indian science. You see in this slide, I have put two pictures. One picture is belongs to October 17, 1947, where Indian health, India's health minister, Rajkumari Amritkar, receiving penicillin, which is a basic drug, but we were not able to artificially synthesize it within India, so we are receiving it from Canada. Okay, and after 75 years, on June, uh, on March 3, 2021, we were giving COVID-19 vaccine to Canada. So this is the power of. Indian science. This slide is showing the power of my department, Department of Atomic Energy. You know when Indo-US nuclear deal was done in 2008, there was a lot of fuss about, in US specifically, that whether US should go to that nuclear deal or is it fruitful to them. So there was a famous scientist, Professor Haker, which was the emeritus director at uh, he has having very powerful positions in US government. He has published a particular paper, Adventures in Scientific Nuclear Diplomacy. This is a particular paper, I have just shown it. And I have, whatever he has written, I have just quoted it, I have just pasted it in the right side. So you see what he has written, what he is saying about India and specifically Department of Atomic Energy. Constrained by section, Sanctions, India developed most of its nuclear energy capabilities indigenously, especially its excellent nuclear R&D. The extent and, uh, extent and functionality of its nuclear 
experimental facilities are matched only those by Russia and are far away what is left in the US. I believe India has the most technically ambitious and innovative nuclear energy program in the world. Our government has been a concern about leakage of US nuclear technologies to India when we should instead be trying to learn from that country. So this is the power of India. So I will end my presentation with the quote of Dr. Sarupalli Radhakrishnan, a life of joy and happiness is possible only based on the scientific knowledge and science. So I hope that with you young generation, we will take, we will take India to newer heights when it will reach into 2047. such an informative talk. You have indeed broadened our horizons by providing us with the different career options in basic sciences. You have made us aware of the diverse future prospects one can look forward to. The institutions and internships mentioned by you will be quite fruitful to all of us. You exposed us to the different branches and industries that are emerging in the modern days. I'm sure everyone present here have been benefited from this talk. Thank you once again, sir. Now I call upon Ms. Ananya to introduce our next resource person on the career opportunities in biological sciences, Dr. Sudhir Singh. Thank you, Disha. I'm Ananya from BSc Microbiology and I will take forward this session for Biological Sciences. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sudhir Singh. He is the Scientific Officer of Level G in the Nuclear Agriculture and Biotechno Biotechnology Division at Harbour Atomic Research Centre, Mumbai. He joined BARC in 2003 after graduating from the 46th batch of OCES training program. He did his MSc in Biotechnology from the University of Calicut and PhD from Mumbai University. Dr. Sudhir Singh has also worked as a visiting scientist at Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute, South Korea, during the years 2011 to 2013. Currently, he is working on enhancing camptothecin content in an Indian medicinal plant, Ophiorhiza species, using modern tools of plant biotechnology. He has published several papers in refereed international journals of repute. We are very fortunate to have you, sir. I'm now, I would now request you to address the session on career opportunities in biological science. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. So very good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good to get this feeling of good morning, sir. So, how many of you are uh, biology graduates or doing uh, graduation in biology? So, this may be a good number. So, I also did my... Okay, good. Thank you. So, you all have good numbers. So, I also did BSc in physiology, botany and chemistry almost 25 years back. So, it's a proof that yes, if we are pursuing our dreams, we can excel in whatever discipline we take. So, uh, one thing before I start my presentation, I want to assure you, any one of you, whether it is a first year or second year, please don't have any regret that you have joined graduation just out of choice. You are at right place, at right institute, just you have to pursue your science, get into the basics of your subjects and I assure you, you will have ample opportunities in coming 5 to 10 years. That's what message is. And coming to the research in life sciences, in next 40 minutes, I along with my two friends, Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Ananda, will take you to the journey of biological sciences. First, the opportunities part, in continuation of what Dr. Nigam has mentioned. And then second part, if you are given a biological problem, how you should approach your research. Because that's where you will start enjoying the science. So this is just uh, uh, just revisiting what Dr. Nigam has already mentioned, where all opportunities are. So because you already have crossed the BSc, 
MSc, I shall request that you all share, apart from the conventional MSc's, also try to look for the specialized MSc courses, not just MSc Biotechnology per se, including your MSc in Agriculture, MSc in Food Technology, in, in MSc in Environmental Biology, Developmental Biology, Biomedical Engineering. These are some of the upcoming MSc wherein you will have more specialized exposure and in turn more and more opportunities when you go post MSc for looking for the job or looking for the PhD problems. And you should also explore whether you can, if anybody, especially the people who are interested to go for the marketing. So with biology in your knowledge and along with the marketing skill, you can also do the MBA and that will also have huge opportunity because a large number of biotech based companies are coming up and they will require those MBA graduates in coming future. Also job opportunities, I mention in every my presentation, post BSc please don't look for your jobs. Opportunity is very, very limited. Just for the time sake, you may see that, okay, I will be getting 20,000, 25,000, and I should join immediately after BSc. But after working for four to five years, you will realize the kind of satisfaction, the kind of res respect you deserve, you are not getting. So must do your master's, that is a must, because you have come into the domain of BSc. BSc per se will not give you satisfaction, must do MSc and if possible pursue your dreams further to the PhD which will open you plenty of area in coming 4 to 5 years. Coming to the post MSc, what you shall do, first thing you all must target whatever post graduate students are here that they should keep in their calendar that by the third semester or by the time they complete their MSc, they have JRF in their hand. Because once JRF in hand, you can uh, apply to the, all the research institute across India for PhD and not just that, even other than PhD research programs or research projects where they are there, you can use this fellowship as a, as a tool to get the salary as well as pursue the, how the science is done. Apart from that, you can also do the MTech, specialized courses as the uh, engineering institutes, then PhD. That is the important step, especially you want to pursue in R&D department, that can be in, in India also or abroad. But with the more and more research coming into our India, I shall request that you all should uh, look for the opportunities in India. You have plenty of institutes where you can explore and do the PhD. And coming to the job opportunities. And that's where your most of the jobs will come because it may look blunt, it may look very hard fact, but take a fact that government, the opportunities post MSc or for that matter post PhD in government sectors won't be that much with respect to the number of people entering into the market. So, be prepared yourself that the more and more opportunity will come in the private sector and look what are the private sector areas, core areas, core expertise they require so that you can keep on preparing yourself right from the masters. After PhD, of course, you have postdoctoral research abroad as well as in India you can do and also you have job opportunities in government sector as well as private sector with a special emphasis I am giving on startups because that is the booming field in, ca in case of biotechnology. And down I have mentioned some of the exams that you should look for, especially one exam I would like to mention just like JRF I mentioned. You all must write MSc in biotechnology, a common entrance conducted by JNU that gives the opportunity for more than 500 seats in one single exam. So most of the departments are DBD funded. You will have fellowship also as well as you will get exposure to a lot of research also. <coughs> Coming to career opportunities, especially post MSc and post PhD, what you can, you can have academic career, like my friend uh, Dr. Nigam told, academic career, what I means, you can join as a lecturer, you can join as an assistant professor, and then with the gain of experience and expertise, you will move into the ladder to become associate professor and then finally professor, and just like your professor sitting here, you can be faculty even at the college. But for that, you have to go through the learning and uh, increasing your wisdom and taking your science how you can communicate to them. Then, research opportunities in scientific institutes. Many of you must be aware that India has more than uh, three, four hundred research institutes across India. And there are some prominent ones like BAE. My senior colleague, Dr. Dakta, has already mentioned. Then we have BRC, then CSIR. More than 40 institutes are, umbrella institutes are there under CSIR where a lot of opportunity for your job will come. Then we have ICAR, Indian Council for Agriculture Research under which more than hundreds of institutes are there across. But there also you will get opportunity to work as a scientist through a common exam what we call as the ARS that you also you may mark. That is a common exam written by uh, 
uh, especially who want to do and do the research in agriculture sciences field. Then you have TIFR, NCBS, JNU, IISC, the Dream Institute for any of your uh, basic fund, whoever wants to do the fundamental research. Coming to the other career, other than the going to the academic career, you can have job opportunities in the industry, especially in the field of R&D, production, contract research, what we call it as a CRO, that is contract research organization, that is also coming in big way, then uh, QC and product management, then technical, medical writing, clinical trials, it's a very hot field these days, and then biomechanics and data analysis, because in future data is going to be the coin more the data a company or a person is having or the a person who is having expertise to handle and make out meaningful information from the huge data that will be generated is going to give a lot of advantage for all kind of jobs, not just limited to the biotechnology per se. Then, bio-entrepreneurship. Please, like I told in previous slide also, see that whether you yourself can start company and give jobs to others because that's where government is putting a lot of money, giving a lot of efforts. If you have the right idea and you see the market for your idea, definitely government is there to fund that and that I shall explain in a uh, slide briefly. And also you have a training uh, training uh, options at various institutes because bio biology field is relatively faster evolving. So don't limit yourself only to the theoretical part because that's where your, uh, your expertise will be limited. Try to get as much workshops, training, summer training, project work, Wherever you get a chance, you try to go and see how exactly research is done. Because biological systems are quite tricky. One system doesn't get replicated to the other. And if you get hands-on experience in that, you will be more equipped to handle any of the research problem that is given to you in your career. Out of all the fields, biotechnology is a promising, most promising, I shall say. Uh, and uh, biotechnology, I again wish to clarify, that doesn't mean that BSc Zoology, BSc Botany, BSc Microbiology, they don't qualify for the biotechnology. Biotechnology per se is not any specific field. It is a merger of all the learning what you will be acquiring during graduation and post-graduation. But it is just the application of that because that's where your basic fundamental uh, research goes into the production or some product which makes some, brings some market value. That's the overall technology of this biotech case. And why this is promising? Because bioeconomy in 2021, just last year, is valued at more than 80 billion US dollars. And it is ranked in top 12 bioeconomy across the globe. And it is going to be further increased, like it is going to post almost 150 US, uh, billion US dollars just by another three years, that means 2025. And most important thing for you all youngsters that it is going to generate maximum job in biological field more than 1.5 lakhs. I am talking about just 3-4 years time. And these are some of the secrets to show how the startups are coming up. Almost 3 to 4 startups are registered daily. So you have right idea. You have your fund, funding will be sponsored by the government of India. And what are some important sectors? These are uh, biopharmaceuticals because that is related to the health and that's where the majority of opportunity will be generated and it is in last 2021 it accounted for almost 54 percent of total revenue uh, that uh, has come that includes biosimilar that includes biotherapeutic antibodies or therapeutic proteins recombinant proteins vaccines insulin all these recombinant proteins which are having uh, value more, more than several billions is getting to get maximum share of jobs that we generate at future. Followed by that, because our India is an agriculture-based country, there also a lot of opportunities will be generated, especially in the field of transgenic research, then plant tissue culture field, then biofertilizer, biopesticides, food processing and biofuels, because government is now mandatory to add bioethanol in your fuels in coming years, and that is going to increase in future. Then we have bioservices. That's where we are going to make big because everybody these days want to do IT, IT, IT. Why we have gained so much of IT? Because of our uh, reasonably cheaper uh, expertise available in our country and that's where we can make, uh, add into, because we can make good recombinant antibodies here, we can do the uh, cheaper services compared to the what is available in US and European market. And that's what our India can in cash on and that's where a lot of revenue and the money will come. Then we have bio-industry. If you have your own product, 
like many of the recombinant enzymes are used in uh, your uh, leather treatment or be it uh, your washing powder. So there also with more and more affordability, people are ready to buy even little expensive washing uh, powders or those kind of products which can increase your uh, the quality of life. So key areas to look for in coming years is just like the previous slide, biopharma is going to be the key area where the majority of jobs will be generated and some of the prominent company that you can look for and very, many of you are aware also is including Serum Institute at Pune. Why? Which vaccine? Okay. So we could learn about Serum Institute only after COVID came. But let me tell you, the Serum Institute in India was the biggest vaccine producer of the world even before COVID. Majority of polio vaccines were produced there also. And it is in terms of number of vials as well as value it is the number one vaccine company across the globe. Then we have Biocon, then Bharat Biotech, Reliance Life Sciences, Zydals, E, Bharat Biologically, E, Arbindo, Bapart. These are some of the important companies which are working in field of vaccine production, your biosimilar therapeutic antibodies production and recombinant, anti recombinant protein production. Then in BioAgri, prominent player these days is Mahiko and Monsanto who are into the business of BT cotton. What is BT cotton? Transgenic? Cotton. Okay. So transgenic cotton primarily. And then you have tissue culture based company like Jad Irrigation, KF Bioplants and Bioprime if you can see the Bioprime I especially included because one of the, our PhD students has start up, started with the startups and now we have raised this company to close to 6 to 7 crores in a span of 10 years. So he did PhD, gained on experience, how to approach a problem, got the funding from Virat and now he has he along with two of his friends is having his own company. So it's very much possible if you have science to back you and science fundamentals strong to support that. Then in bioservices, some of the prominent companies include Syngene, Reliance Life Sciences, Paraxel, Iquia and uh, uh, Acubest. Many of you will be aware that what exactly these companies does. So basically they do the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics. Any drug that comes into the market, you have to do the clinical trials, complete the data validation, then only the drug can be released. So those studies are uh, done in India at a much reasonable price than that they can be done in the Europe and US. Then bioindustry, as I mentioned, recombinant, your all the restriction enzymes are produced through the recombinant way. So that's where, the, that is one field, then enzymes which will be having high commercial value. And the last one, I am giving you uh, just a glimpse of a startup, that's, why, that's what where I am emphasizing is, so that's where majority of jobs will be created and you can itself add in a startup. Why it is so, if you see the journey of startups right from the 2015, in just seven years, that number has gone from 700 to close to 5,000 plus. And as of today, I can say it is 6,000 plus. And it is increasing. Another opportunity for the startups in biotech is that you need not to be located in Mumbai or any specific city per se. You can operate or set up your lab even in the remote places because of accessibility of all the resources. And they are distributed across India. And what I also wish to say that Virat, which is the government of India, Department of Biotechnology body, funds all the, your ideas if you present and defend those and produce a, a strong case in front of them. So they will help right from the inception, of, if you have an idea, right from the idea, how you can take up to the, some uh, uh, research, then how you can develop a product and how you can market the product and take it to the market. So at all steps, the Virat will help and provide the funding for that. And you all must explore that how you can add to that uh, startup boom. Uh, so with that, I shall stop and I will request my friend Dr. Ananda to then take further that how a biological problem should be addressed. Lightning talk. In this current situation, when we get up, we, when we all are thinking about our career choices, your talk has helped us eliminate the block in our minds. You have shared information on the different exams and research institutes covering various fields. Your delivery of knowledge has kept our audience at alert and I'm sure most of us will be benefited by it. Thank you again, sir. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anand G. Mazumdar. He is the scientific officer of level D in bioorganic division at Bhava Optomics Resource Center, Mumbai. 
He joined BARC in 2017 after graduating from the 60th batch of OCES training program. He obtained his master's degree in biotechnology from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Currently, he is working on understanding the role of topoisomerases in cancer. Uh, I will now uh, call upon uh, Aditya to introduce our next followed speaker, Dr. Ganesh Pai. Thank you, Ananya. So, myself, Aditya Mishra, aspirant of TYBC Zoology. It's my immense pleasure to introduce you all, uh, a resource person, uh, Dr. Ganesh B. Paisal. So, he's a scientific official at the uh, D level. So, Sri Ganesh Paisal joined the uh, Baba Atomic Center in 2016 after doing his graduation from 59th batch of OCES uh, training, training program. He often is a master's degree in applied zoology from the Mangalore University. And currently, he is working as an understanding, uh, working as a uh, understanding autophagy as a mode of resistance to PARP inhibitor uh, based on a cancer therapy. So, be the students of uh, Wilson College. Uh, glad to have you, sir. Please uh, be on a stage and proceed with the uh, session. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, so out of those two speakers, I am Ananda. Yeah. <laughs> so, when I joined my BSc in Microbiology honors, Calcutta University, uh, I was a little sad because most of my friends either went to engineering or got to medical. So, for the first few months, I was a little sad that uh, I hope I am not wasted. So, uh, however, when I kept following the discipline of science, then I came across multiple stories where people just like us, they solved problems for the human civilization and they completely altered the course of human civilization. So I'll start with a couple of those stories. You must have heard these stories thousands of times since the time you joined BSc or probably from the 12th standard, but these stories are worth repeating because they have shaped careers throughout centuries. So this fine gentleman, he uh, was working at St. Mary's Hospital London and he uh, went for a leave and then he came back, he was working on a bacterium called Staphylococcus, he causes throat and ear infections. And uh, so he was looking for things that he needs to throw out from the lab. So he saw that in some plates, uh, the bacteria failed to grow around uh, colonies of fungi. And he asked the question, why does this happen? So I'm sure you know this gentleman. So uh, does anybody know who this is? Yes, this is Sir Alexander Fleming. And he ended up discovering penicillin, which came at a very crucial juncture of human civilization because the world was at the cusp of the Second World War. And by the time the Second World War ended, uh, also a great feat for the chemist because by this time he discovered this in sometime in the 1930s. By the end of 1945, chemists had already figured out how to synthesize it artificially in the lab. So penicillin as an antibiotic ended up saving almost half the soldiers who got wounded in the first world, Second World War. In a similar story, there was another disease which was a terror to mankind. It claimed almost 30 crore lives and uh, it was called smallpox and no parent would be confident that a child would survive till the child has survived smallpox. You may have heard about it from your parents or grandparents. So I'm sure you know who this person is. So he discovered the first official vaccine of this world. So he asked a very simple question that he observed milkmaids. Milkmaids often used to get infected by a milder form of pox called cowpox. And once a milkmaid would be infected with cowpox, then subsequently, cowpox is not lethal to humans. So subsequently, when the person will get infected with smallpox, that person would often survive, which was not the case for normal people. So he asked the question, why does it do this? Why does it happen? So he kept on working on it. And in the end, he ended up with a vaccine that has saved innumerable number of lives. And in the year 1980, the world was declared to be free of smallpox. So I am Anand, as I said, and with my friend Ganesh, we will take you on a small journey of the different facets of conducting research in the field of life sciences. So life science is a very diverse field, and life scientists in the field of life sciences ask diverse questions like, how does the body feel the touch, pressure, or heat? How do cells kill themselves? Do cells actually kill themselves? Or is the human genome static or it can change from time to time? Or can we play with the human genome? How does the body know where it is in space and time? How do you stand 
and not fall down? And how do you know how to do everything that you do? How our memory is created? Can we use water molecules to image the human body? So these, it's a wide spectrum of questions that you can choose to answer. And I have taken a very few examples. These are questions which, uh, for answering which, people were awarded Nobel Prizes in the past. So I'm sure most of the people here are aware of this Five Kingdom classification by Whitaker. So traditionally, uh, in the field of biology, there has been an unsaid division of labor. So the, do the kingdoms of Monera and Protista was uh, the do traditionally the domain of microbiologists. Plants used to belong to botanists. Fungi traditionally used to belong to botanists, and later it came down to microbiologists and animals, of course, to zoologists. However, the world has changed till then, uh, uh, since then, and we are in the new era of science. And now, the different branches of biology are not categorized according to what you study. It is categorized according to how you study it. So, now, we categorize science in the field of life sciences as to in what detail you study an event. So if you study an event, you decide to study an event at the level of a population. You study a population of plants, you study a population of animals, it comes under the domain of population biology or population genetics. Now once you reach a single organism level, it can be a bacterium, it can be a human, it can be a plant, you come into the domain of physiology, anatomy, genetics or development. Now you have gone inside the organism. So you are done studying the organism, you have gone inside it. So now you are into the single cell level. You can have cell biology, metabolism, biochemistry, a host of uh, subjects. Now once you are inside the cell, you are into the domain of molecular biology, where you study life processes that happen inside the cell. So you can study replication, transcription, translation, a number of cellular processes. And this is where the maximum detail is uh, obtained of the smallest entities inside the cell, that is you are studying individual molecules, that is the uh, domain of structural biology. It can be either extra crystallography or it can be a cryo-electron microscopy. So once you go from population biology to structural biology, this is the vertical expansion of science. So you pick a problem, you keep digging deeper and you try to gain as much knowledge as possible about everything that there is in the problem. However, once you have reached the level of structural biology, you have studied, suppose you have a problem at hand and you have studied every single molecule at the structural level and what it does, every reaction mechanism, still you will not have the whole story what goes behind the problem. In order to do that, you need to go back up because to obtain the bigger picture, you first need to get close, study everything and then get back and look at the bigger picture. So at that level, you have the assimilation of knowledge and where you actually find the answer to the problem. So, why do we do basic research? So, the idea of basic research in any field is helping mankind. It can be any way. Uh, it can be drugs, it can be a new gadget, it can be moving out of earth. However, how you do it? That is understanding nature. So first, humans have to learn how the laws of nature work. Whatever happens around us, why does it happen? You first need to learn that. And then only, once you have learned the laws, then you can bend the laws to your benefit. So, once you gain the knowledge of how things work, you can go to the destination. Also, in some cases, for example, prime example is the is the COVID pandemic. It creates, sometimes, necessities create investigation. So once uh, the COVID pandemic took over, then people went uh, back and did a lot of structural biology. They solved the structure of the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID variant, and then they came up uh, with uh, what receptor it uh, uh, works with, and then they worked out the immunology of it, and they ended up with the vaccine. So in order to do a work, you know, you need to apply force, you need to use some instruments and then you get results. In case of basic science, the forces are the different domains of science, that uh, life sciences that I have already explained. It can be cell biology, microbiology, genetics, any field that you choose. Then you have the tools, that is applied research. My friend is going to talk about the fields of applied research. So in broad terms, applied research can be genetic engineering, biotechnology, plant breeding, systems biology, anything that you choose. And out of that come the results, which are the visible results that are available either in the market or improves your life. That can be vaccines, drugs, or shelf life extension of crops or fruits, uh, antibiotics or antibodies. So the, fields, the field of life sciences that I have already told, so I have discussed a few fields here that scientists choose and take up as a uh, take up as a career option. So once you go from BSc to MSc, no matter which 
subject to do an MSc in. You can be a botanist, you can be a zoologist. As I said in the beginning, that your science will be defined on at what level you study a problem. You can be a plant scientist and you can do the exact same thing as an animal scientist does, defined by the fact that at what level you are studying. So you can either be a cell biologist, which cell biology deals with the structure and function of cells, or you can go for molecular biology, as I said, it studies fundamental cellular processes. You can be a plant biologist, uh, the study of plants, and then there is a discipline, wholly dedicated discipline of the human brain, that is neurobiology, how memories are formed, how the human brain functions. Then there is developmental biology, which is a miracle of, a miracle of nature, that how a zygote becomes a fully functional organism. There is immunology, and I'm sure most of you would uh, uh, appreciate the power of the field of immunology because it keeps giving us vaccines against uh, deadly diseases. Then there is microbiology and uh, genetics. Genetics is a very classical field, and uh, through the time, genetics has transformed from classical genetics to molecular genetics. And of course, you can have biochemistry and biophysics, which gives you information about single molecules and how molecules behave. So, uh, just as I said, that your science will be defined on what you study, on how you study a problem, not what you study. So, I have taken a case in point of basic science that is cell biology. So, cell biology, as I said, it's understanding the structure, function, and behavior of cells. So, suppose you're a plant biologist or mammalian biologist or a microbiologist. I have taken the examples. When you work with cell biology, the questions you ask will be very similar. They would be in the lines of how do cells divide. In case of mammalian biologists, we'll call, call it cell cycle. In case of microbiologists, we'll call, call it cell division. Or how do cells talk to each other? In case of a mammalian biologist, we'll call it signal transduction. A microbiologist will call it quorum sensing. Or there are certain parts of exclusive parts of working with a specific field. For example, for a mammalian biologist, that person can study vesicular transport, which is generally not defined to be present in bacteria. Or a microbiologist can work with chemotaxis, which is generally not present in mammalian cells. A very big uh, exception to this is the field of cancer biology. It's a very popular and aggressively studied uh, field in the field of life sciences. However, cancer biology cannot be categorized into any of the disciplines. Why? Because it is more of a composite field. It is a uh, cancer is a very, of course, it's a deadly disease. However, as a research model, it is extremely elegant and it's a very smart disease. So once you want to study cancer biology, a lot of fields have to come together and contribute. So in case of cancer biology, you can have biochemistry where you can study the different alterations of the metabolic pathways that happen in a cancer. You, of course, cell biology and molecular biology are the things that provide the chunks of information. And both me and Ganesh, we work in the field of cell biology and molecular biology. So you can uh, study about cell cycle dysregulation or autophagy or cellular signaling. In case of molecular biology, you can talk about DNA damage response or things like, like that. There is cancer immunology, and of course there is cancer genetics, as many of you may have heard about familial BRCA mutations and how it works, how it was worked out that it causes breast cancer. So next, my friend Ganesh is going to talk about how basic and applied research in life sciences go hand in hand. I'll be back after a while. something like the basic unit. What is there in aloo, majorly? Starch. What is the basic unit of starch? Oh. Okay, so the thing what I'm going to describe now, a disease, and why I'm sp speaking about this disease is, all that has been spoken about here by uh, Anando has something to do in uh, this particular field, that is diabetes, and that of COVID vaccine. So coming back to the thing what I'm speaking about, the glucose, right? Glucose or sugar? Have you heard about sugar? Yes. Or diabetes? How many of you are, are aware about diabetes? Please raise your hands. How many of you are from biology? Please raise your hands. Yes. So all of you are aware about diabetes even though you are not from uh, biology field, right? So such is the pervasiveness of the disease and uh, the importance of what I am speaking now here. Okay. 
So, um, okay. So whatever I've uh, whatever I've had in the morning, that glucose has been converted to glycogen by something. What is that hormone? Insulin. So that is what uh, I'm going to speak about in the coming slides. Insulin and its counterpart. Can I have the name of the other hormone which converts glycogen into glucose? No? Glucagon? Okay, so let us uh, come to the next slide and uh, see what is diabetes basically. So diabetes is a disease and most of us have probably heard about these symptoms, right? So uh, unexplained weight changes, frequent hunger, frequent thirst, thirst, frequent urination, yes or no? Yes. At least one or, or one or the other uh, familiar member would have diabetes these days. It's a lifestyle, a lifestyle disease. And every one of them would have faced this particular problem in their life, uh, in their uh, course of having diabetes, right? Yes or no? Yes. So, earlier to 1920, people did not know that this was a disease. Diabetes was a disease was not known actually. All these people were, were studying them as individual symptoms, but not as a disease. So, diabetes is the condition where the body is unable to metabolize sugar or uh, there is a dysregulation of glucose in the blood. That is the uh, basic uh, explanation of the disease per se. So identifying these individual symptoms as those belonging to diabetes was done in the period of 1900s. Okay, So that was a research in itself. Yes or no? Yes. So prior to the discovery of the insulin, that is the hormone, people would die of this, this particular disease, diabetes. Can, can you imagine a person who is being diagnosed with diabetes dying within one year? Can you imagine that? A person with cancer probably, now you can imagine that he is going to, or he or she is going to not survive long. But with diabetes, is that so now? No. So you can control that, right? So the control of diabetes is because of one particular major discovery and that is due to the discovery of Insulin, yes. So the only way, before the discovery of insulin, the only way you could save that person to a certain extent was to starve that person. So you would not get aloo parata in the morning. You would starve them in such a way that the caloric, value, the, the, the caloric intake, the diet would be minimized in such a way that even after, after some time, maybe one, one and a half years, the person would die because of caloric restriction itself. Right? So such was the uh, period before uh, the, the discovery of insulin for diabetics. So before the insulin discovery, diabetic patient would be starved to, con uh, to maintain a low glucose level because that is what creates a problem later on. So there are so many things to it. So it would lead to death eventually. Okay. But now after the discovery of insulin in the 1920s, what has happened? The patient is administered with the injection of insulin and he will be hale and hearty. So that would be the case now, but now there are cases still with insulin injection, the patient's glucose are not controlled. But now the modern has, uh, modern medicine, the basic research which has gone into it, is able to control glucose levels in those patients as well by using certain other ways, not the insulin injection alone. So all these things, whatever uh, understanding has been gained, that has been gained because of basic sciences research and that is what I want to impress upon in this, this particular uh, presentation. So discovery of insulin gave hope, yes, and is a wonderful example that shows the importance of basic life sciences research and its application in medicine. Basically, whatever we do in biology, if it has a medic medicinal application, that is what we are aiming for, right? So the uh, research in cancer, research in uh, for developing anti-cancer drugs, for any medicine for that matter. Everything is to increase the lifespan of the person, right? So that is what we are looking for. And also to improve the life of the uh, person, of course. So diabetes is a dreaded disease not only before 1920s, it is a diabetes, uh, it's a dreaded disease even now. Okay, why? It's because according to UN, uh, UN uh, World Health Organization, one person is diagnosed with diabetes every five seconds on this planet. And one person dies from diabetes related complications every 10 seconds on this planet. So I am not uh, scaring you people, but you should be aware about this particular fact. That is the enormity of the disease that we are looking at. But everything is controllable. 
right? Controllable with proper diet and the medicines, of course, which we are going to speak about. And everything thanks to science. So the game changer, what I had speak, uh, spoken about, was the discovery of insulin. And it happened in the period of 1920 to 22, okay? So, uh, standing on the shoulder of giants, so there were uh, four people who have majorly con uh, who have contributed to the discovery of insulin, but not alone. Basically, standing on the shoulder of giants means the person who have carried out research earlier, people have taken and understood the literature, what they have like the knowledge which they have uh, gained, and people have assimilated that and then developed on it. It's not like all of a sudden they came to know okay, the insulin is uh, synthesized by something on uh, in the pancreas, right? So it is like the basic information was there, but the discovery happened in that particular period. So standing on the shoulder of giant, that's the basis of all the science there is, right? They, uh, Banting and Best suspected that insulin might be produced in islets of Langerhans. Where are these present? Yes, I've already told that. Yes. So crude preparation from the dog pancreas. Basically, the example, uh, the experimental animal they had used was cute dogs, beagle for their experimentations, okay. So, uh, this was done in uh, the McLeod's lab, in uh, Dr. McLeod's lab in 1921. This is in uh, Canada. So, how to prepare insulin, or they are called as islatin. That time it was called, not uh, insulin, it was called as islatin, because they were present, isolated from islets of Langerhans. So, islatin, which route of administration? So, when I explain to you the experiment, what they have done, you will come to know how important the route of administration is. How is the insulin given to patients? Right? So, uh, that is also very important, okay? So, we'll come to that also. But how to purify insulin? So, during the course of experimentation, the purification of insulin is also very important, right? So, uh, uh, I'll explain it to you when we come to the experimental part. So, Frederick Banting and John MacLeod gave, uh, gave us the, uh, were given the Nobel Prize for this discovery of insulin in 1922. They did their experiments in 1920 and 21. Can you, imp uh, can you understand the importance of this discovery? That's why within a span of only one year, they received the Nobel Prize. So such was the importance of the discovery of insulin, right? So uh, that is the photo of Banting and Best with the, the experimental dog. Okay, so this discovery of insulin, basically whenever you observe something, right, that is basically, that is the starting of uh, science, right. So uh, what they observed was, they could, they could prepare an experimental model by removing a, can, a pancreas of the dogs. So when pancreas was removed, the uh, dysregulation of glucose was there in their blood and that could be used as a model for diabetes for a short term period, right. So what they did was, they took one more dog. They isolated the pancreas and isolated something called as crude preparation of pancreatic islets of Langerhans. Okay, and they gave it to dogs with diabetes. That is the model which they had uh, taken out uh, pancreas from. And to us, uh, the ones uh, who had administered this particular uh, pancreatic uh, preparation, they had survived. Uh, their glucose levels were fine. But the ones uh, with the uh, like in which the pancreatic preparation was not given, did not survive, of course, because of the blood glucose levels went haywire. So that's how the discovery of insulin happened. This was the first, this was the experiment which they performed in the dog. But is it, uh, is it okay to stop with the dog? It has to be translated to humans as, as well, right? So that's when the application would be fulfilled. So what they did was, they went, to, went on to the human trial, the first human trial was done in 1921 December and it was done on a person called Leonard Thompson. The first they administered, that was the thing, they administered in the pancreatic preparation via mouth. But it got digested just like the alu paratha which I spoke about that time, right? So it did not uh, work. But the second time, what they did was they injected the insulin, the preparation what they did. But this time the blood glucose was under control and now we had a cure or control of diabetes with this particular extract preparation. First time when they injected it did not work. Why? Because they injected a crude preparation, right? They took the help of a second person whose name is James Pollock. His, he was a biochemist who was specialized in the field of purification of these enzymes. So in uh, enzymes in the sense, the insulin for that matter, hormone. 
So the pure purification, uh, purification, purified form of pancreatic extract worked in this case, and that is the uh, importance of biochemistry aspect here, right? So this is the story of Leonard Thompson. Thompson. He was the first person to get the injection of uh, the pancreatic preparation, and what happened was he was a juvenile diabetes, uh, juvenile diabetes uh, having patient, uh, patient. He was just 14 years. Can you see the on the if you get Im uh, image on the left? He is just 14 years, but he doesn't look like that, right? So that is what hormonal imbalance does to you. But in a span of only two months, from December, this is the image from uh, December 20, 15, 2020, uh, 1921, and the image on the left and uh, on the right is February 15, 19, uh, 1922. Can you see within a period of two months, the patient has regained his weight and he is normal now because of one discovery and injection that is insulin. So understanding the basic science behind the origin of insulin synthesis and functioning of insulin aided the person to combat diabetes. Okay, the next big question was, the insulin has worked at the organismal level, but how does it happen at the cellular level? That's also a question in itself, right? Yes or no? So that to understand that there are cell biologists who work. So what we do is, this is the simplistic way as to say how an insulin molecule works. So there are uh, receptors on uh, uh, cells. Basically, this uh, is a liver cell. You have insulin receptors. Insulin goes and binds to the insulin receptors, opening up channels which take in what? Glucose within the cell and thereby glucose can be stored in the form of glycogen. That's how it works. So understanding all these things is a stepwise process and probably would have happened over a period of 15 to 20 years. But this is just one slide in my presentation here. That is how it goes. That is what basic science is about. It's an arduous journey, but an enjoyable one, right? So can we synthesize insulin? That is one more question which people had asked, right? Can we synthesize insulin? Yes or no? Yes. People synthesize insulin and uh, most of you would be liking to go into the field of biotechnology as the uh, uh, as all of you would be enjoying in uh, biotechnology basically. So now biosynthesis of insulin is a uh, point in case here which they have used uh, recombinant DNA technology you, they have used recombinant DNA technology to synthesize insulin here. So uh, this is the procedure which I will not go into detail. Basically the basic life sciences research chemistry and recombinant DNA technology all and the synthesis of all these fields have helped synthesize insulin and its application in medicine, right? Yes. So now I have mentioned to you only one form of diabetes. There is no insulin synthesis. Yes, you can synthesize, uh, give them insulin from uh, externally and get the blood glucose under control and diabetes as well. But there are multiple forms of diabetes as well, right? So the ones who, uh, whose bodies do not produce enough insulin, you can give insulin. So basically, the structure of insulin, pro-insulin, all those things also go into understanding of all these things. So basic biochemistry and structural biology are very important in, uh, in this, this particular field. But where body produces enough insulin, but still the uh, body is not able to respond to the insulin thing. So how do you control those? So that is done with the help of chemistry basically. So if you understand the chemistry behind how a process works, so you can control all these things. That was done in the presence of metformin and glimepiride. If you go back to, uh, when you go back to home, what you do is, if there are any patients with diabetes, you just check what the med what the kind of medicines are given to them. So glimepiride and metformin would surely be one of those medicines who, uh, which they are given. So basically these are the ones which, uh, which sensitize the blood cell, uh, which sensitize the cells to take up glucose in the presence of insulin basically, right? So there are two types now. There is one is insulin dependent, the other one is insulin dependent. But even if these two drugs are given, still and plus insulin is given, this body does not respond. So what will you do then, then to control the blood glucose levels? So one cue comes from nephrology or the study of uh, kidneys or basically nephrons. So how does kidney work? You are aware about how nephrons function, right? Yes. So the blood gets purified by nephrons, they say, right? But at the same time, what happens is, in the proximal convoluted tube, just look into the image there, what happens is the glucose has to be reabsorbed, right? Reabsorption is glu of glucose is very important. If that step 
where the glucose reabsorption is stopped from the uh, urinary material, can it be uh, can it be controlled? It doesn't come back to the blood, right? So you can control the uh, blood glucose levels in that way. Yes. So one cue has come from nephrology, and that is how you can control the diabetes in a different way. So the whole class of drugs called glyphosates function in this particular way. So wherein you are not tar targeting the cells which synthesize insulin or whatever it is, or sensitize insulin uh, uh, by uh, giving them metformin or something like that. You are targeting a whole new organ, that is kidneys, to control diabetes. How wonderful that is, right? So that is, uh, though that is the beauty of science. So the answers for your question can come from multiple points or multiple sources. That is what I would like to impress upon this. Okay, so the next title what I would like to say is Usage of Engineering or Physics for Understanding Chemistry in the Arena of Life Sciences. So how many of you would have uh, measured glucose levels in the blood by using a glucometer? Yes, you would have used something called as a portable glucometer. So do you know how it works? Okay, that's our homework for today. You just look into how it works basically. Okay, you can Google it and you'll come to know how it works. So that is the usage of, actually the physics is involved here to understand glucose. Glucose levels in the blood, that is chemistry. But where is it helping? It's in the arena of life sciences, right? So that's how it, uh, it's a mixture of uh, work by physician, that is to diagnose the disease, a biochemist to understand what is the, uh, what are the blood glucose levels? A chemist for synthesis of the drugs, that is metformin and glimipiride. A microbiologist, probably to synthesize, uh, like to synthesize insulin by recombinantian technology. And an engineer to all these, do all these things. So that's how intricate the mechanisms of understanding diabetes is. So that is what like I would like to impress upon you. That this is a mixture of all uh, understandings from all these fields which are helping in this particular field of diabetes. Right? So, uh, one more thing which uh, I would like to speak about is uh, de development of AstraZeneca uh, COVID vaccine. What is the name of the vaccine? COVID <laughs> Yes. So, uh, the scientific name per se, it can be called as CHAD, Chimpanzee Adenovirus, CHADOX2. Yes. So, basically what has been done is, you uh, take the spike protein which is there on the coronavirus and express those uh, uh, protein, spike proteins on the adenovirus of chimpanzee basically which is uh, tolerable by the human body and you get the immune response of the same intensity or slightly less in humans by giving this particular vaccine, right? So to understand all these things, there are a whole lot of things to uh, 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 understand that is in this particular field. Right? So to understand that coronavirus, to get the COVID vaccine uh, from adenovirus, you have a whole lot of discoveries which has, a, uh, which has come about in a period of maybe 100-150 years. But you see only the two years of COVID vaccine development, right? But so many things have happened over a period of 150 years that probably people would ignore. But it is very important. So all these people who have worked, right? All these people who have worked for the development of vaccine, which we see today, have worked with the motto of Wilson College. What is it? Vishwas, Asha and Pray for science, basically. Right? So that's, that's what uh, I would like to convey and probably that's how they developed uh, uh, this particular vaccine coming into 2021. Yeah, thank you. So, probably, uh, I'm going to conclude. basic and applied research go hand in hand. I gave you a brief introduction about how and the different fields of science that are uh, different questions that are asked by biologists and how they go about answering them. Now the question is, in today's world you cannot do science in isolation. Every field of science is intricately connected to every other field and every field of science ends up contributing to its sister field. So physicists will, will contribute to biology, chemists will also contribute to biology. So there are different paths to the same, bio, the same destination. To uh, give this example, uh, to uh, explain this, I'll uh, pick a brief, brief problem. Uh, is anybody aware about the protein folding problem? 
Anybody has heard about this gentleman called Cyrus Leventhal? Leventhal's paradox, anybody? Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, body makes uh, large proteins, right? 250 amino acids, 1000 amino acids, and proteins fold very fast. So the question uh, that has all, always intrigued biologists, or specifically biochemists, is how does a protein fold? A protein has a very complicated structure, and the cell needs to fold a protein very fast, in a matter of milliseconds. How does it happen? So Cyrus Leventhal, he pointed out something very, uh, a very pertinent question, that suppose there are a peptide which has only 10 amino acids. Okay, and the peptide, each amino acid can rotate its bonds in different ways. Now you assume that there are only 10 possible conformations for each amino acid. Okay, so how many conformations do you have? 10 into 10, that is 100 conformations, right? Now, if a protein can even sample one conformation per second, it's going to take an enormous amount of time for a protein to fold, which is larger than the lifespan of a human being, or even larger than that. Okay. So that cannot happen, right? So that means that a cell does not sample every conformation that a protein can take before it reaches the native state. So there came, then came a person called Christian Anfinsen, Anfinsen's experiment. Has anybody studied Anfinsen's experiment? Okay, so Christian Anfinsen was a biochemist who worked with a protein called ribonuclease A, RNA A. So what he did was that he did a very simple experiment. So he denatured the protein first with urea and he slowly dialyzed the urea out of the protein solution and he saw that ribonuclease A completely regains its activity once you denature it that way. So there was, the whole experiment was done in the test tube. There was no cell, right? The protein was entirely denatured and renatured. How does that happen? So he gave a statement that the complete information for the native structure of a protein is contained in the amino acid sequence itself. Now, Cut to 2018. This statement was given in the year 1961. In 2018, so in between, various scientists have tried to approach this problem in different ways. However, it was accepted that the answer will come from computational biology. So there was this uh, couple of gentlemen called Chow and Fassman. So they come, came up with a very smart algorithm called the Chow Fassman algorithm. It can predict the secondary structure from a primary structure. So if you give a primary structure to the Chow Fassman algorithm, it's going to tell you with reasonable confidence which one is going to be an alpha helix, which one is going to be a beta helix. Now, cut to 2018, there is this company called DeepMind with uh, support from Google. They developed a software called AlphaFold. Now, as we spoke in the different disciplines of life sciences, we spoke about the field of structural biology. So, structural biology deals with the structure of molecules and primarily and in many ways, the structure of proteins. So, uh, the way they do that is either by extra crystallography or by wet lab work. So what DeepMind did was that they created, they created an artificial intelligence powered uh, software which is now able to fold proteins inside computers. So 30 years of structural biology work is now contained within computers and it has been shown that all the structures of generally globular proteins that the humans have ever solved has been correctly predicted by the uh, alpha fold algorithm. So that is the power of contribution of different fields of research in the field of life sciences. So, to drive this point home, I would point out a few, I know, I am sure you know all of these people. So, many of these people, they have made significant contributions to the field of biology and in general science. And many of these people are not even trained biologists. For example, Venkat Raman Ramakrishna, 2009, Nobel in Chemistry, he is a physics by training. His MSc was in physics, his PhD was in physics. Similarly, Dr. G and Professor G. N. Ramachandran, he is also a physicist and there are different people from different fields of biology also, like Barbara McClintock. Everybody knows about Barbara McClintock. She was from agriculture background. So this is the last part. So when I come to this, uh, when I come to this, I speak about science in general. I'm not speaking about biology anymore. So suppose this is the length and breadth of human knowledge. When you go into school, you acquire a little bit of knowledge and you get acquainted with the world around you. When you go into high school, your radius of understanding increases. And finally, you go into graduation where you break off from the conventional uh, mode of education and you pick a specialization. This is where most of you are right now. And then, I hope many of you will go into MSc where your specialization is going to deepen. 
and finally some of you will join a PhD. When you join PhD, you read a lot of research papers, you pick a question and read a lot of research papers. Once you do that, you reach the boundary of human knowledge. So you have asked a question and you have almost gone to the boundary of what humans know about it. And then your PhD begins. You will press there for a few years and then you will break through the boundary and that's going to be your PhD. You have worked on a problem for a few years and then you have pushed the boundary of human knowledge. Now from the center, it looks like a black and white world. But when you're sitting there, the world will look different because you have gone through a journey now. So in the year 1947, when our country became independent, an average Indian would live for 35 years. That was the average life expectancy. Today, in 2022, an average Indian survives for 70 years. This is not just biology, it is physics, engineering, chemistry, every conceivable branch of science. So I hope you would be prepared to push the boundaries of human knowledge and I wish you everyone a very happy learning experience. Thank you. Do we have chemistry students present in this hall? Yes. 
so who has discovered the concept of chemical bonding? <laughs> Professor Joel Lewis. And when he has discovered, when he has given this concept, it has revolutionized the whole, uh, all the disciplines. You know about the penicillin? Yes. Who has discovered this? And equally important is the synthesis of artificial synthesis of penicillin. It has saved many more, many lives than all the wars together have taken. Who has, uh, uh, who has invented the commercial synthesis of ammonia? Do, have, do we really have chemistry students? <laughs> yes? When this question, we will ask at the end of this uh, seminar. <laughs> so, Prince Heber. And when he did so, he has ensured that uh, chemistry has uh, saved many, many people, many lives from starving. Likewise, chemistry has contributed uh, in addressing energy challenges, mitigating environmental challenges and has contributed to many breakthroughs which happened in last few decades. And if we see, it is, con it is a continuous evolution of the uh, subject and it is uh, venturing into different fields which have created plethora of applications and possibilities. And if we categorize the opportunity, it can be divided into four sectors. We have very dedicated sectors which de demands, which there, where there is a high demand for chemists. And we have research institutes ranging from premier research institute to university, state and uh, central university. As Sandeep sir has told you, there are more than thousands of institutes which offers research opportunities as well as positions. And if we see, there are dedicated industries also. And if we talk about startups, these industries once were the startups. And now they are dealing in thousands of crores of rupees. So you can see the potential of the chemist, uh, chemical startups. If we come into uh, government organizations, the chemists are required as a geochemist, DR in DRDO, ISRO, ONGC. They have very specific role to play and very crucial role too. Without their contribution, the operation of these uh, organizations will, will not move. And for this, they are, uh, they, are, they, they are paid very attractive salaries, but you have to secure first class in your MSc and you have to have a very great store. After this, there are several other government organizations which employ chemists. And as Dimple Man has uh, told you in the, in the first lecture, that we are from BRC and BRC is dealing with every frontier areas in basic sciences. I will talk about chemistry and I will show you what we are doing in chemistry. We are doing research from radio pharmaceuticals to hydrogen economy. We are doing research in water uh, chemistry, chemistry to actinide chemistry. No one is in, in this uh, India doing research in actinide chemistry. From polymer chemistry, theoretical chemistry to nuclear materials. Such a wide, wide span we are covering in chemistry. And you can join this premier institute after graduation through CAT1 training. After post graduation through OCS. After PhD through KS, KSKRA. So we have the opening at each and every level. And if you, are, if you want to pursue research in these areas, you can apply to HBNI and you can work with BRC scientists. Coming to Indian chemical industry, what, we, what scope we are having in the industry? If we look at the Indian chemical industry, we rank sixth in the world. Our chemical sector is expected to grow and contribute 25% of GDP. What is the GDP of India at, at, uh, currently? What, what is the GDP? We have made the headlines few, few months back. We have become 3 trillion economy. What is 3 trillion economy? 3 lakh crores rupees. 300 or 300? Uh, 300, 300 lakh crore rupees. So if you see the 25% of that and divide it, let us say for simplicity, you want that, let, and assume that each candidate is offered 1 lakh rupee. You divide the 25% by 1 lakh and you can see how much amount of jobs are waiting in for uh, by 2025. We deal with 80,000 chemical products and government is also having very positive sentiments and it has started out national plan for advanced chemistry energy storage 
allocated many lakh crore rupees for the uh, development of this sector. This sector basically deals with, uh, uh, deals in all these areas. I will just uh, tell you what we have achieved in last 75 years. We have become the highest manufacturer of agrochemical products. We have uh, we have good we have major importers and suppliers of specialty chemicals, uh, active pharmaceuticals, ingredient and petrochemicals. And if we see there is a strong there is a very big scope in in these area fragrance industry, food, chemist and forensic science. Fragrant, if, we, if you see the worldwide, the fragrance industry is 224 billion. And in India, India's contribution is just five, uh, 500 million right now. So there is a strong, uh, there is a very big scope lying in this sector. And it can be uh, fulfilled only by chemists. And these industries will flourish only with the contribution of chemists and biochemists. Apart from uh, these industry, if you have to, if you have to, I have been told that only two minutes are left. So this slide is already told you by the Sandeep sir. So we will move to the last uh, uh, last part of the presentation that there are many startups. I have listed very, uh, some startups I have listed in this, uh, in this slide. So by pursuing chemistry, you can benefit, you can contribute to the benefit, the benefit of the mankind and in that process you can turn your product into a startup. So that is the scope and at last I just want to tell you that do not confuse your success in career with the uh, uh, overall success. When many success come together then it becomes a real success which has to be cultivated by your courage and patience and right attitude. With this I would like to thank you for your kind patience. for giving us knowledge regarding various fields under chemical science. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Vinita Grova Gupta, Scientific Officer, G-Level Chemistry Division, BARC. Dr. Vinita Grova Gupta is presently working as Scientific Officer, G, Chemistry Division, Baba Atomic Research Center. She is solid state chemist working extensively in the area of materials for energy and nuclear application. She has to her credit 95 publications in addition to several book chapters. She is the recipient of several awards that include Young Scientist Award bestowed by Department of Atomic Energy, Indian Nuclear Society and Indian Society of Chemists and Biologists, DAE Scientific and Technical Excellence Award, IANCAS Dr. Tharun Dutta Memorial Award and DAE SSPS Young Achiever Award. She is also the Fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and Associate Academician, Asia Pacific Academy of Materials. Now I request Dr. Vinita Grover to please come forward and speak chemistry for energy.
energy means energy uh, de uh, desires, let's say, are, uh, are actually fulfilled by coal, oil, natural gas. Proven technologies, cost wise effective, high energy density problem, they will, you know, they are going to exhaust. But we have to survive for long. Our children, their children, we want to survive, right? So, and also, biggest uh, uh, additional disadvantages that they have a lot of harmful impact on the environment, which is not done, which won't be tolerated. So, what is the option? The option is the renewable sources of energy. How do we feel fresh? What is the most renewable source of energy that doesn't get exhausted? Sleep. Sleep. No doubt about it. But the problem is for sleep also we need good AC, good fan. So energy has to be developed. That to the energy that can be replenished. That to the energy that doesn't cause any harm. So we have sources like solar, wind, hydro, tidal, geothermal. And last but not the least, my alma mater, my institution, we work for nuclear energy. Okay, so advantages we just discussed. Disadvantages I want to uh, you to be aware of the fact that suppose I am talking of solar energy that is not going to be available throughout the day. Is it going to be available? No, only during the day hours. Rat ko fan chalane to kya karenge? That means this is an intermittent source of energy, so I have to produce it and I need to store it. So I have to work towards it. Second, because it is still in the developmental stage, actually they're costly. So a lot of research has to go into it. In what three ways? Basically, you have to produce energy. So what we have to do? As a chemist, you have to develop materials, methods and processes and devices which can work towards, first you have to harvest the energy, whatever energy is available. Once that energy is harvested, you have to convert it into electricity, right? Because you are not going to use solar energy. Na, dhup mein khade ke kya Third, once you have uh, converted into electricity, you need the means to store it because you want to actually operate your mobile phones or your laptop. Fourth, you have to convert them into affordable technology. Fifth, because we are not leaving coal, oil and natural gas, we have to work upon by on the decarbonization. Sixth, Sandeep mentioned in the beginning that the world is actually moving towards hydrogen economy. How much of hydrogen is there in the atmosphere? Any idea? PPM level. Okay? So we have to produce hydrogen, we have to store hydrogen, we have to convert it into electricity. Huge amount. Believe me guys, each of these circles represent an excellent area of opportunity for you to find your career in. Okay, so I just discussed some of them, you know, energy te storage technologies, what are energy storage technologies? One of them is actually in your hand, in your mobile phone, lithium ion battery. So if we really got to work on renewable technology, I need to work upon the materials that can convert that energy into electricity and store it. So those are your batteries, your supercapacitors. What are supercapacitors? Suppose you want to push. Let's say मुझे break लगा रहा है, मुझे jerk of energy चाहिए, your battery can't do it. That is what super capacitor. Okay? Then hydrogen economy. Hydrogen has to be produced. Now here I want to bring you a concept. You know right now hydrogen is produced by from biomass, coal, oil, natural gas. But that gives out carbon dioxide. We have a very good source of hydrogen with us, which is water. How much of earth is water? Seventy percent. Won't that be very super cool and super awesome if I am able to get hydrogen from that water? But you know, breaking that water molecules require temperature as high as 2400 degrees centigrade. So I would be a big fool if I use that much energy to break water molecules get hydrogen. Okay? So a lot of technologies, research into chemical science has to go for converting this water into hydrogen. Now once you have produced hydrogen, you would want to store it. Where do we store our gases? LPG kids we store it like But cylinder in Malumay for storing 1 kg of hydrogen, I need 11,000 liter of cylinder. Bombinity jada hai. So that is why we need to develop advanced material which in the smaller volume can actually absorb a lot of hydrogen. Okay? Then that hydrogen has to be converted into electricity. Of course, a lot of chemistry would be needed to get a net zero carbon. India is committed to go to a net zero carbon by 2050. So this is where 
Of course, all the chemists will have to work along with the biologists and physicists. You heard that dialogue in order. Hami hum hai to kya hum? Ka we have to do together. Okay. So research opportunities. Just I'll give you the glimpse because I have to finish it up. You know, a rewind to you in ten minutes. You know, lithium ion battery. You have lithium ion battery in your phone. Problem kya hai? Lithium is concentrated only in few countries. Then we all know the dangers associated with lithium. You heard about batteries exploding and all. So the research is needed for developing efficient batteries from ions which are cheaper, which are safer, and that is sodium, aluminium, magnesium available in India in a plenty and very safe. But a lot of research is needed. Still, these batteries have not become commercial, and this is where you know the upcoming chemists believe me. A very good area for startup. Energy storage is an excellent area for startup. Then advanced material for hydrogen storage we talked about. Improved catalysts for various industrial processes and advanced material for getting a net zero carbon. That is carbon capture, uptake, and softening. So basically, you know, when you work towards chemical sciences and developing these materials, you are not just gaining an earning for yourself. That's not just a challenge, but you are giving back to the society. Okay. So, and then in last uh, this thing, I talked about nuclear energy. Now I I told you about solar energy, hydro hydro power, and all they are intermittent. Har jage you don't have water. Har jage you don't have solar energy. But nuclear energy is one such energy which is inexhaustible because you need very small amount to get lot of energy. Also, you know this particular energy is low carbon. It is not intermittent. So that is why the world is actually accepting nuclear energy, but still they have to work a lot to get its acceptance. And that is where the chemist would come. Okay. So how does chemistry help it? Do you know somebody tells me reactor to engineer when I tell you. और फ्यूजन फ्यूजन तो फिर से करते हैं केमिस्ट क्या करता है इफ द केमिस्ट इज नॉट देयर द रिएक्टर विल नॉट रन यू नो रिएक्टर इज गॉट स्टेनलेस स्टील जिरकोनिया हेवी वाटर एवरी डे इन एंड डे आउट दीज मटेरियल्स आर प्रेजेंट एट हाई टेंपरेचर हाई प्रेशर दे अंडर गो मेनी रिएक्शंस हु विल सॉल्व दैट प्रॉब्लम सो केमिस्ट आर इंपॉर्टेंट ट्रैवल थ्रू द केमिस्ट्री बेस्ड सॉल्यूशन टू एग्जिस्टिंग रिक्वायरमेंट इन द फ्यूल सेल्स then developing futuristic nuclear energy material and what is that i'll give you a small example do we want fukushima to happen we have to make accident tolerant fuel accident tolerant reactor but suppose i take a new material i will have to see how will that material behave at 1100 degree centigrade which is the reactor center line temperature how will that material react with water how will that material be stable to the radiation that is present in the reactor all these research is carried out by chemists this is where the world is looking at chemist chemist nuclear energy cannot prosper without good research in chemical research so uh, uh, an upcoming material is uh, the direction is material informatics which basically is nothing but the machine learning in artificial intelligence this is one of the areas that has already been told by my predecessors that could actually be upcoming because here is what you will be able to choose some material rather than working on thousand of them to get good result with this because my time is over but i hope that your good time begins so i'll just leave you here okay so this is a lecture and thank you all of you thank you so much for giving us brief knowledge on chemistry for energy now i call upon my colleague ms sakshi to introduce dr sharmishta datta and dr hira kendu basu thank you shreya good afternoon to one and all present here i sakshi panjal would now like to introduce our next guest of honor and speaker the most intuitive and respected dr sharmishta datta chaudhary Further more about her is that she has obtained her MSc degree in chemistry with gold medal from Jadavpur University Kolkata in the year 2000. She carried out her PhD research at Chaha Institute of Nuclear Physics that too in Kolkata and subsequently joined Bhabha Atomic Research Center in Mumbai where she is currently working as a scientific officer. 
She carried out her postdoctoral research in the laboratory of Professor Lekovic at University of Maryland in Baltimore. She has published more than 60 papers in international journals. She is recipient of several awards including the Young Scientist Awards from the National Academy of Sciences in India, Department of Atomic Energy and Indian National Science Academy. She has also received the Women Excellence Research Grant Award from SERB and DST. I would now like to call upon Dr. Sarmishtha Datta Chaudhary to enlighten us on the chemistry of healthcare. from our biosciences uh, friends. But uh, now since we are here on the occasion of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, let us just take a moment to recollect some of the success stories in healthcare that Indian scientists have achieved. So I think you will all agree that Covaxin is a matter of pride for all Indians. It has been indigenously developed and it has helped in saving so many lives. And uh, we also heard how India is now a leading manufacturer and supplier of generic drugs. So we have the nickname of being the pharmacy of the world. And another example I have included here, just to make you aware of the scope of chemistry in healthcare, that is the blood bag. You know, till 19, late 1970s, even 1980s, our country used to rely on glass bottles for storing and transporting blood. Because we didn't have the technology for blood bags and importing blood bag was so expensive for us. So just a small team of chemists in a small village in Kerala, they took up the challenge and they developed a polymer material based on PVC. You all know PVC? Yes. So based on that, they developed a non-toxic formulation which was just right to make the blood bags. And here also we have excelled now and we are one of the leading suppliers of this life-saving product. So with this, let us just consider what health and healthcare actually implies for chemical sciences. So health, we know, is a condition of complete physical as well as mental well-being, right? And chemistry helps in maintaining the healthy conditions in the form of antiseptics, in the form of sanitizers. So this is one headline which we all are used to see and feel proud of during the early days of the uh, pandemic that many small chemistry labs all over the country, they started using their knowledge of chemistry and preparing sanitizers which were very much in short supply at that, at that time and urgently needed. So we all can contribute in small ways. Okay, science contributes throughout your life. Anyway, despite our best efforts, disease conditions uh, do happen because of structural functional disorder. And again, chemistry contributes in all stages, right from prediction and prevention to cure. So starting with uh, prediction or diagnostics, what we need to detect? We need to detect different pathogens, infectious agents, biomarkers which tell us about the onset of diseases and what we desire in our diagnostic systems. They should be fast, they should give us results very quickly, they should be accurate, sensitive, we don't want false positives. Also, they have to be affordable and they should be applicable at the point of care or point of need, so portability. And all of these challenging issues can be addressed through chemistry because we have a number of tools available to us. What are these tools? The first example that I have here is colorimetry. You know colorimetry, one of the most simplest and easiest way by which you can detect and analyze through your naked eye just by looking at the color change. So there is, this is one study which was done in our laboratories at DRC where gold nanoparticles were prepared and used to detect melamine which is a milk adulterant. Another very important tool, fluorescence. Have you all studied about fluorescence? Yes. It is the emission of light from the excited state. And why it is so interesting? It is interesting because it is a very, very sensitive technique. So sensitive that you can even see 
pseudo fluorescent molecules if you have a good microscope so fluorescence method can be used for detecting analytes in small amounts different kinds of biomolecules and it can be either a fluorescence turn on where you have increase in intensity or turn off where you have a decrease in intensity so both methods can be used electrochemistry is another method very useful and also it can be made very portable so here i have shown one example where drc has developed a low cost method to detect cancer cells in biopsy samples if you see the graph here you can see how the current change it is different for normal cells and cancer cells and very easily you can uh, understand cancer cells okay now moving on to chemistry in drugs and therapy so this is one image just i wanted to leave on your mind you see how the non communicable diseases have increased over the years so in the morning we talked about diabetes which is a very uh, matter of concern a non communicable disease so we have to prepare ourselves not only change our lifestyles but also as upcoming scientists you have to be prepared to face this uh, challenging issues this disease and there are many different ways chemotherapy we know the traditional mode of treatment with drugs which by chemical action lead to physiological changes another common therapeutic modality you may be familiar with radiation therapy where you can treat cancer cells by exposure to an external beam of radiation and when we talk of radiation therapy we also need other chemicals other agents which can help in improving the effect of the radiation so they are called radio sensitizers at the same time you need other type of chemical agents which can protect your normal cells we don't want to kill our normal cells with the radiation so we also need radio protectors okay now imagine how nice it will be if if you can inject the radioactive material directly into your body so that is also an interesting research area work has been done gold radioactive gold was prepared and made into nanoparticles and injected inside this is a study done in mice model and it shows very good results another treatment modality photodynamic therapy where you use light to excite your molecule which creates reactive oxygen species which helps in killing the cancer cells another emerging modality is hyperthermia here you develop some material some chemicals like iron oxide nanoparticles which are magnetic in nature so if you expose to a alternating magnetic field it can heat up the cells internally so the temperature is raised above the normal physiological temperature and that helps in killing the disease cells so these are some images where you can see how the tumor size has reduced by subjecting to magnetic field okay the third important area where chemistry plays a role is in drug formulation it is not only enough to have your drug you also have to deliver it in the right place in the right manner and in a timely manner and that is where chemi chemical formulation plays a big role many times you know the cost of the drug is not because of the drug molecule it is because of the costly formulation that is required to deliver the drug so here again you have a large number of options available for you you have surfactant molecules you have lipids you have all different kinds of uh, bio biomolecules also peptides and so on nanoparticle formulations you can prepare so just two examples i have shown here one is a very uh, new and upcoming material called hydroxyapatite it is an inorganic material which has the same composition as your bones and teeth so if you can make nanoparticles out of it you can load your drug in a large amount into that nanoparticle and then you can use it for drug delivery similarly protein nanoparticles can be made with very cheap readily available proteins and use them for drug delivery so this is the last message that i want to leave you with that is chemistry plays a role in all stages right from understanding your disease mechanism different cellular processes identification so that there you have your diagnostic procedures we need improved probes improved techniques improved therapeutic uh, designs different methods of drug synthesis so all of this uh there are a lot of opportunities for basic and applied research and of course artificial intelligence and machine learning is coming up to provide a very good and effective treatment method so i hope many of you will be motivated to pursue these areas 
and uh, my next uh, colleague who will be now talking about the ener uh, environment aspect and how chemistry contributes. Inside on the chemistry and healthcare. Now, I would like to introduce our next resource person, honorably respected Dr. Hira Kendu Basu, who is currently working as scientific officer at F level in analytical chemistry division at BARC. He completed his BSc from Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir under Calcutta University in 2005 and MSc from Calcutta University in 2007. He then joined BARC after completion of OCES 52nd batch with Homi uh, Baba Award. He received his MTech in Nuclear Science and Engineering and PhD in Chemistry from HBNI India. His areas of research interest are Environmental Analytical Chemistry, Development of Hybrid Materials, Polymeric Nanocomposites, Core Shell Nanoparticles, Colloidal Migration Study, Natural Radioactivity, Calorimetric Sensors and Development of Indigenous Standard Reference. He has published more than 70 papers in international peer reviewed journals, 60 conference publications and co-authored 6 book chapters. He has been awarded by DAE Scientist Award in 2019. I would now love, uh, now call upon Dr. Hirakindu Basu to brief us with chemistry for environment. Yeah, thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. In continuation to whatever has been spoken by my previous colleagues, I will just uh, give a glimpse of the activities and the research areas where you can work upon uh, for the chemistry of environment. Uh, even its resolution by all the member states has adopted 17 different goals for the development of the uh, world. And for this sustainable development, there are some economic pillars, there are some goals which need social reformation for, uh, for their achievement, and they, but there are, uh, there are at least six goals which require the intervention of the chemistry for their successful achievement. So role of the chemist mainly is twofold. One is the monitoring, monitoring of different parameters, or whether their values are within the prescribed limit or not. Suppose any of the values, any of the values of the parameter goes beyond the advisable limit, then we have to find out their mitigation. So here the rules of the chemist is to find the proper methodology, proper processes to find out the new material, advanced material for their mitigation. So with these, there are, uh, here uh, I have shown the different areas where a lot of research activities are going on. I give a glimpse of these activities in the former slide. Now, coming first to the chemistry for clean water. As you have seen in the earlier uh, slides that 70% in the world is wa water. But out of the 70% water, how much water do we have for the use? Out of this water, only 3% is in the uh, potable form, means in the fresh water form. And out of this 3%, 2% is present in the glacier, which is not accessible. And out of the remaining 1%, which is available in the form of surface water or ground water, we, we use it for our consumption purposes. So the uh, local municipality bodies which uh, deliver this water to the household and uh, to the industrial units, what they do, they do some simple chemistry like initial cleaning of the water, some uh, addition of some chemical for the coagulation, propulation, then sedimentation, filtration to take place and they do carry out the disinfection of that water before distributing it to the community. The traditional approaches for the cleaning of the water has been absorption, adsorption, membrane processes, flocculation, catalysis and disinfection. But with the uh, advancement of the civilization, the contamination of this potable water uh, has created a lot of issues. There are different elements like uh, toxic elements, uh, trace elements, heavy metals, which has come into the aquatic bodies sometimes, radionuclides also, some pharmaceuticals, uh, organic dyes, electronic waste and the oil spillage. They have all contaminated the, our 1% available water system. So here the major role of the chemist is to how to get that water decontaminated. 
so there are there have been different materials developed and and still scientists are working to improve these materials how they can be used for the decontamination of water uh, in DE also lot of activities are going on for carrying out research on these materials including our laboratories and uh, so one by one I will just uh, brief you about these materials first one is a composite of the nano composite material composite are a mixture of two or many different components where each component perform their role independently or sometimes they may even develop a synergistic effect now if two components are mixed at the microscopic or molecular level we call them hybrid material mixing two components at the microscopic level leads to a formation of homogeneous material which is advantages in the sense like for example the functionality of the organic molecule can be mixed with the stability of the inorganic one and the property of this new developed material will be in between the properties of the individual components or sometimes they will even develop a new property then there are hydrogels hydrogels are uh, long chain cross link polymeric network which will contain a lot of water apart from the healthcare application the hydrogels have been applied for the water decontamination purposes also then coming to the nanoparticle different kind of nanoparticles have been studied and used for the de water decontamination one uh, such nanoparticle is the coarser type of nanoparticle it is a concentric nanoparticle where each layer is uh, chemically different now what is the advantage of using this hybrid materials or social type of nanomaticals particle if i take one example of arsenic contamination which is very common in various areas of uh, in, the, in the world including india eastern part of the india so uh, the arsenic it is present in the arsenic seal and the arsenic spike these two are the predominant species of arsenic present in the groundwater now out of these two species decontamination of arsenic five is easier but for arsenic 3 that is more toxic so but decontamination of arsenic 3 being it is a neutral species is difficult so what we can do in using de this developing this kind of material we can develop a core and a chemical different shape which will one of that component will take care for the conversion of arsenic 3 to arsenic 5 and another component will take care for the decontamination of the arsenic now uh, some of these developed material may not be very specific or selective to a particular class or particular individual components or, or contaminants. So for that people or rather scientists uh, functionalize those nanoparticles with specific organic groups to make them specific or selective towards a particular uh, pollutant. Now then there are membrane technologies and lot of research is going on for the development or improvement of this main membrane, uh, improvement of their anti-polling properties, their strain, their shelf life and all. Uh, depending on the pore sizes of this membrane, we have to apply different pressures. And based on the pressure and your pore sizes of the membrane, we we'll name them differently, like microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is a term which you may be familiar with. So we use uh, advanced membrane in this kind of reverse osmosis processes. Now, based on this membrane technology, sea water desalination has become a po possible, although it is not very economical till date, but if you can make it economical, this is going to solve our drinking water problem. Some plants are already operational for the sea water decontamination, uh, sea water desalination rather. Then, for the organic pollutant, uh, we can, using some solvent, we can remove the organic pollutant, but then another approach is to degrade that pollutant. For this, so different doped titanium oxide nanoparticle and other nanomaterials have been used while further basically it is oxidized or reduced the organic pollutant it is degraded to a less harmful or a novel toxic form. Then there are two advanced approaches for the water potable water decontamination I have mentioned here. One is the development of the photothermal device. Photothermal materials are materials which can harvest the whole solar spectrum and convert it to heat with extremely high efficiency. Together with a heat cross management structure, it can lead to the formation of the uh, photothermal devices for efficient solar evaporation and distillation. So, and this device, uh, if it is made operational, it will be, uh, it will operate without the need of the electricity, that is the advantage. And then, and another kind of materials which are micro and nano motors, they are still in the designing stage in the lab. Uh, they are proposed to be designed in two parts. The front part of the head part will have the active ingredient and the tail part will will have the propulsion mechanism. The advantage is that for this kind of material if you want to decontaminate a large water body, our static decontamination process may not be that efficient. But if we have this kind of micro nanomotor which can go to the furthest corner, corner of the water body, it decontamination will be much more efficient. Now moving next, that is the uh, chemist has to do a lot for the maintaining the air quality or rather to clean the uh, uh, air and for the air, the causes of the air pollution and their effects, we, we all know, I am not going into that. The role of the chemistry is the sampling, the detection of various pollutants into the air, their regular monitoring and their uh, remediation techniques. 
some, <coughs> some examples are the development in the uh, catalytic converter. The improvement in the catalytic conversion, uh, converter technology has made us possible to uh, increase the standard, to improve our standard of heavy vehicular uh, in emission. Then the CHC, which is harmful, has, has been replaced. Artificial vein, carbon dioxide sequestration, these are all different fields where a lot of activities are going on. I am not uh, going into the details of this uh, now. Then, uh, because I have only two minutes, I just finished uh, telling her uh, one or two minutes for each slide. The waste treatment, lot, lot of industry is required to be done for the treating of the different kind of waste. Two examples are EOS. Uh, you know from the EOS, lot of EOS will be generating, including India, uh, all over the world. So from that, we can segregate the uh, useful part, that is the precious metal, like gold, copper, uh, using some developed material and chemistry, lot of chemistry is involved there and the toxic elements also we can segregate out and this is the use of the negative, the lower one is the use of the radiation technology that is the our department of atomic energy very much involved in this type of activities while uh, using gamma ray radiation from a, from a cobalt 60 gamma source we can convert the sewage sludge, municipal waste that is the sewage sludge to a useful fertilizer form. Now, Next one, the various kind of sensors are required. Nowadays, we come across sensor uh, starting from your smartphone to uh, the CCTV cameras and everywhere. So, a lot of chemistry is involved for developing different kind of sensors. I'm not going into the details. Different kind of nanoparticles that functionally is formed are used for development of the colorimetric sensors, motion based sensors. The electric emission sensors are very common for the gas detections. Um, now, this is the last slide. I'll just ask one question that uh, do we come across radioactivity in our day to day life? Yes. yes. Ah, your answer is yes, it is expected. There are various radionuclides which are available, they have natural abundance, they are present everywhere in this building material, in our food item, in the meal, or, or banana, whatever we eat, whatever, whichever is having a rich source of potassium, and so many radon and all getting uh, emitted from this building material. So, radioactivity is present everywhere, there is no harm to do with it, only when it is excess level, we have to contain and confine it, otherwise there is none, uh, what is what the message we want to convey is that there is, uh, this uh, radiation is not at all harmful the natural radiation. And this natural radioactivity from radionuclides like C14, uh, lead to 10, they can be used for some useful purposes. So can you uh, extract some information using those uh, the properties of those radionuclides to date the environmental samples, various geological materials, what is the age of the contaminant, what is the age of the geological matrix. So for those useful purposes, we can use the natural radioactivity. With this, I will uh, end and a big thank you from the whole chemistry team. For for this useful talk on environmental chemistry. I would now call upon Ms. Sai Durga to introduce Dr. Shraddha S. Desai, the scientific officer at F level in Solid State Physics Division in BARC. As they say, the best thing should be always kept for the last. Now we proceed to the subject of physics. Greetings to one and all present here. I am Sayadurga Chitankoti from DYBSC Physics. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Mrs. Shraddha S. Desai. She is currently working as a scientific officer in solid state physics uh, at Baba Atomic Research Center. She completed her undergraduation from SPK College, Savanwadi, her graduation from Institute, Institute of Science, her postdoctorate degree in physics, specializing on the subject of development of position sensitive detectors for neutron scattering applications from the University of Mumbai. Additionally, she had a postdoctoral fellowship at Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute, South Korea. She has worked in SSPD, BARC since 1988 on indigenous development of neutron detectors. These detectors are installed in various neutron scattering spectrometers at Ruwa reactor. Moreover, she has authored 70 publications and presently is working on large multiwire based 2D neutron detectors. These mere words may not describe her as whole. Therefore, I won't waste any more time further and deprive you all of her presence and knowledge. Thank you. Wilson College because I had written 
got two exams from one of the classrooms which the CEO was sitting. And here it, it was really nostalgic to visit again this um, college. And other one from Pat is my senior whom I worked with and I'm carrying out his BJC, um, Dr. Baidi Dande. He is a graduate student of this college. He passed out in 1958 and joined after MSc, he joined DRC. So uh, it's really uh, thanks for inviting me over here. So now I would give you a small glance of how uh, you have a career opportunities in the physics. Usually you have a um, misconception that there are not many job opportunities in physics, whereas everyone prefers chemistry. So I just want to know how many are physics here. Okay, good number. <laughs> you, uh, anyway, but I'm happy that you are here to hear this. But okay, this is um, particle right till the universe. So in our physical range we get very small domain but there are huge opportunities for the physicists too. So now you will get a glimpse of it how it's Jai Anusandan is not just a slogan to say but how government works with it like how how much of the funding and all you uh, it will be coming over there within the uh, next few years. So just to give you the glimpse of how if you are Having any technological development, whether it is a laptop, um, uh, mobile in your hand, or anything that you use today, has physics has a major contribution to it, along with all the other branches of the, uh, science. So you cannot separate out the branches of science on the technological point of view. It is only a specialization that you can get be your expert of, but you cannot work without bridging them with each other. So even for a making simplest pen or anything, you need a biologist, you need a chemist and mechanical engineer and plus an artist to design and a commerce person to make it affordable to be in your pocket. So just I will uh, list out few, tech, uh, few techniques in which you can carry out your research because these are the frontier areas in which we need an indigenous development rather than depending on imported things. So the basic research is just a the secret of major art to be explored. I won't go into much of the detail. Then material characterization, that is a special materials for the hostile condition. Whether it is a cryogenic or a high temperature fusion reactor, you need reactor. You need the materials which will uh, tolerate all this extreme temperatures, extreme pressures. And this is where the physicists and chemists work together to uh, uh, derive a material which is of the expectation. Then only someone can think of making the reactors. Then nuclear physics, nuclear power has been already uh, told you. So in all the supporting R&D that is needed for the nuclear power has to come from the uh, scientists, like physicists, chemists, or as such. Astrophysics, it is um, Nowadays, you are been very much interested. Like, uh, I will show you one of the slides in which one of the MACE telescope is in installed to study the universe. The, then, data mining. Whenever you have mega, having mega facilities, a huge amount of data is generated, and you need to work on the data very systematically because you will have a new huge gigabyte of data, and you will have a very small signature of any event so that you should do it patiently. So that's where the opportunities lies in the simulations. See, uh, when you are, you are building a huge facility, it cannot be built and then said, okay, I want to do this correction, no scope of it. So you need to module, uh, module it first even on your computer. So uh, again, the uh, satellite instrumentation revolution in the telecommunication that you are having a mobile in your hand, and that you also need a lot of uh, materials which are compatible to the satellites when they go in the space. Then the medical imaging and diagnosis where you can directly contribute to the social societal analysis. So these are the various institutes where I would just request you all to do a training internship or at least a one day visit to these such institutes 
so that you get the insight of what actually happens over there, how the things, how the research has been carried out, and where you can stand. Because we are all cashing on on the power of students, where the where age and the uh, enthusiasm to study can really help us in all these things. So uh, students are always welcome. I think these institutions are all listed even by a previous speaker. I would just highlight on the Inter University Center for Astronomy and this Inter University uh, agencies which are bridging between the um, DE facilities for the uh, for usage of the uh, various spectro various facilities and they are bridging between the students of university and this. so. Take, uh, take full advantage of such uh, facilities. The Inter University Consortium, nowadays it is labeled as UGC DAE Consortium, so uh, it will be very useful because whenever you are reaching there, you will get a huge amount of expertise in each and every field you reach the problems you may be facing. So, this is just a um, small glimpse of how the mega facilities in India are existing very recently, I think in last two years. This MES telescope is installed at Ladakh at very high altitude of 4.3 kilometers from the sea level and uh, this is the largest, second largest in the world and this is uh, moving on the 27 uh, meters of the diameter and it is having a different azimuthal angle towards the sky to catch on the uh, various uh, foreign very high energy gamma rays are been detected using the uh, huge number of automatic light views. And now again this data is to be studied, that is on the world of any time it will be open to the students for the study. Now these, are, these are another two upcoming facilities where you are exactly uh, like passing out from your uh, studies and you will be able to get the opportunity to build it and as well as you use it, that's you are in that age group. So this is the LIGO facility coming up at Thingoli in Maharashtra and this is another Indian based neutrino observatory which has been uh, installed at the north, north India, it, is, it will be about 1 kilometer deep down the mountain and uh, to detect the uh, neutrinos. So uh, you can see this is a 50 kiloton of uh, detector which is needed. Presently 1 kiloton detector is operational at Dhruva reactor to study the neutrino, neutrinos emerging from the nuclear fusion. So this is another multinational project which, uh, which is to uh, harvest the energy is a fusion reactor for generating huge amount of uh, energy. So this can be one of the power source which powers the sun. So DT is two isotope of hydrogen fused together with giving a minimum energy generates so 17.6 kV of energy, uh, MeV of energy. There's a huge energy but whether we are ready to have use that uh, fusion energy. So this small type of small experimental facilities are built over. India has a good contribution over in this multinational project and the small tokmak of SST-1 is operational at IPR Gandhi Nagar which is doing the supporting experiments for this facility. Now this is a CERN project which you must have also heard it. This is a neutron, um, this is a particle collider program circulating at a very high speed and allowed to uh, collide on each other and that is there. We are hopeful that it will recreate the uh, condition of the first star uh, like generation of your, our universe. This has al uh, already you must have heard the Higgs boson have been uh, discovered from this uh, facility. Why I am uh, very proudly showing this slide is all this three, five meters diameter of the detectors which you are seeing over here. India has a big contribution in collaborating in making these detectors at DAE as well as TFR and few universities has collaborated and this is operational. And now any, uh, after any collision then thousands of particles are being generated. Each has to be detected for its charge, energy and uh, direction. So that is how we will be uh, going back towards the, um, to study the collision of this. Even when they are building such a huge facilities, it is the R&D which comes along with it is also useful for other other supporting things. So see, the areas revolutionize the medical diagnosis as well as the PET crystals and PET and MRI imaging can be merged together and so how it will uh, improve our medical imaging. So now coming to the actually how physicists can contribute to the public domain is a medical 
imaging for diagnosis as well as therapy. Initially, we were knowing that this is an X-ray film. Now, X-ray imaging has upgraded like revolutionized over the years to MRI, CT scan, then uh, for ther teletherapy machine as a well, drone, PETS, uh, positron emission uh, tomography. So now the purpose is you can contribute even the, without disturbing any of the healthy tissues, whether cancer uh, uh, cells can be uh, killed. So that is how your diagnosis, this is how your contribution in which you can um, help your mankind. Then now coming to the neutron non-destructive testing. Uh, neutron has a very peculiar property in which it can penetrate through a inches of lead but cannot penetrate through a flower or a petal. So because it is stopped by hydrogen. So this property is used over to find the hydride boosters from the other nuclear fuel elements as such. Here I can show you the satellite cable cutters where when you are separating two satellite stages, it is, it is the cable cutter should operate on each and every article so that it um, doesn't, uh, it is like full, your separation of the stages is full through. So this is the one of the detectors I would like to show that this is uh, imaging, beam imaging detector which I have made how the neutron can be imaged over by using a three orthogonal uh, multivars uh, grids and the images which are shown below are the neutron beam images that various two different spectrometers from blue reactor. Now evaluation of semiconductor technology which you can see in 19, uh, you can see the timeline in 1950. Uh, used to have a big, this big radio with the wall type of glass wall type of amplifiers in it and now you can have everything within your bathtub and that's a, but the technology to get mature over the years say how many decades have passed over so somewhere you have to start in your laboratory to mature it so it comes to the counter on the uh, commercial stage so this is the tiniest one nanometer gate transistor which has been recently manufactured by use of the carbon nanotubes so you can have per millimeter and can be 10 raised to 7 in vertical and 10 into 10 raised to 7. So please do the exercise 10 raised to 7 by 10 raised to 7. That many transistors can exist within a 1 millimeter of space that is again going to make a big revolution in the technology. So um, this is all from my side. I would, uh, international journal and recipient of various awards awards like DAE Scientific and Technical Excellence Award, DAE Young Applied Scientist or Technologist Award, HBNI Outstanding Doctoral Student Award, SSPS Best PhD Thesis Award, Young Researcher by Australian Synchron, uh, Oxford University and NSRRC Taiwan. His research interest lies in material physics under extreme thermodynamic conditions of pressure and temperature, in a particular total dynamics in hydrogen rich system at ultra high pressures. He is currently leading the activities of Fourier transform based spectroscopic studies at the high pressure and syn synchrotron radiation. I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. So, we will not go. So, I come back to what Sajjavan asked in the beginning. How many physicists here? Oh, come on, physicists, give me a shout. Show your present. Oh, Lord, not, not enough. <laughs> Science, what it requires is just an infinite mind. So, all of you are physicists and I will try to prove that. We are, I am actually proud to be here because today morning itself I heard that we are actually having a legacy of the student of Professor Kelvin, 
and I'm personally proud because I work from four Kelvin up to thousands of Kelvins, and I am really, really uh, happy to be here in such an auspicious place. And we are actually in mitophagy spectroscopy, so we are actually uh, carrying the legacy. The first gentleman here is Sir Rele. Is he the Rele's name? Yes. Rele's name. So, and this is Professor C. B. Raman. Actually, the story started way back from Galileo, both politics, that church, and all those things. You friend of here. But now, 1852 and 1950 were the hundred years when science changed, mankind changed, everything changed. The first 50 years was the setting of stone where Sir Rele was there. Unki setting stone ko who actually benchmarked those things was Professor C. V. Raman who lived in this era where the great Einstein, Rutherford, Max Planck, the game changer of the modern science, modern uh, humanity were residing in this era. So that was the great touch of Professor C. V. Raman. He could prove himself in that, in that era. And I, I advise all of you to watch this movie, Einstein vs. Eddington. You can find it anywhere. You can see how intense was that era for scientists and researchers. So next 50 years after the year 2000, it was the consolidation of all the discoveries which are made in all the branches of science, and apart from the discovery of lasers and computers. 21st century undoubtedly, whichever branch you are, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, anything is going to the branch of, to the area of artificial intelligence. So I again highlight this point. You have to develop creativity, understand nature, bring happiness to yourself and others with peace and learning. So what is uh, physics uh, spectroscopy generally? This is what, what is this? This is the atomic model. Nucleus, electrons revolving around. What we are trying to do is, we are trying to probe all those properties, whether it is a chemistry property, whether it is a uh, biology property, whether it is an engineering property. We want atoms to probe karna chate. Ultimately, we want to see these atoms, what they are made up of. So we shine something, maybe light, on these on this atom. And what we are trying to do is, Energy level diagram, you know, the electrons, those electrons, they have certain energy, quantized energy, we say, those are discrete energies, not continuous. So the transition takes place, some light is emitted, and we try to understand that light. Actually, every electronic energy level is further composed of several vibrational levels. Vibrational levels are further composed of several rotational levels. And every, yeah, the study of every energy level gives you certain information. For example, if you study the vibrational energy level, you will get the information about the vibrations in atomic, in uh, chemical bonds. And those are actually the fingerprint of any material. So if you would like to go in forensic departments, this is the place, the, these are the kind of things you should study. So what are my future options if I pursue this? I'll just list out them if anybody wants to know. I can go to this personally write to me, I'll give you in detail. AI the spectroscopy is the latest trend, I can tell you. Pharmaceuticals, life surgical procedures, forensics, homeland security, the new word point is bio-defense. One has to be reliant, uh, resilient on bio-defense. Novel material synthesis is the traditional way how physics, the condensed matter physics progresses. What is this cloud? Material properties under extreme pressure and tem temperature. This is an explosion. Composition of heavenly bodies, planets, etc. etc. So we probe all different states of matter from solids to liquids to gases to plasma. You have heard about plasma? Yes. yes. Oh, blood wala plasma nahi hai. It's different. <laughs> so physics of materials encompasses various kinds of materials. Aapne, because chemistry uh, lectures are humse pehle ho chuke hai, I will not go into this slight detail because we have heard about these things in great detail. So how do we do spectroscopy? We do it using electrons, photons and neutrons. Aapko kabhi bhi kisi bhi exam mein question puja jata hai. Isliye please note down. It's just general knowledge question also. How do we do a probe materials? Using electrons, photons and neutrons. And depending upon these things, the instrumentation will change, the optics will change, the applications will change. For different applications, you use different neutrons, different... Uh, means the neutron energies also change. Photons, different wavelengths of photons you use. This is this is the figure which shows different wavelengths in the in the photon uh, of uh, of photons I should say. And this is the electromagnetic spectrum, encompassing from radio waves to gamma rays. Radio waves say mobile communication ho hai. Okay. Then you go to microwaves. Aapke ghar mein cooking ho hai. Then you go to infrared heating and 
vibrational properties. Then you go to visible and UV, the electronic transitions over there. Then you go to X-rays, you study the structure of, uh, of the unit cell structure, the crystal structure, all those things. And then to gamma rays, the, hard, the very highly penetrating rays. So the, there are some laboratory facilities in which you can do this, which is in many institutes. Mein hai. And there are some mega facilities which are national facilities or sometimes international facilities. And this is one such thing. Can you recognize the above picture there? Yeah, I know. Pops are stadium. Hai. Come on. Are you going to study? Barnkede. This is the Barnkede Stadium. So, which one is the one? The one is the spectroscopy laboratory. One single instrument is running there of the size of Barnkede. Electrons are revolving on the circumference of one kid in the internals which are, mock, in, which are in the very high vacuum. And scientists working day and now, night over there to find out material properties. These are the magnificent synchrotron radiation sources which are the only man-made sources uh, which can produce light from throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Extremely bright light. You should know what is the difference between brightness and flux. This is your homework. And this is the Indian facility which is there in Indore. Only one facility in India in Indore. How do we do spectroscopy again? This is the center which I am saying. The electrons are revolving around the, yeah, in the, on the circumference of the one kid and at every bend they are producing some light which is called synchrotron light. It, it carries all the wavelengths, all the wavelengths. So, every branch of science comes to this place to study their material. So, it creates ample opportunities for physicists, Biologist, chemist, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, computer, computer engineer, instrumentation, you name any branch of science. Everybody comes there. This is the nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactor generally power produce karne ke hota hai, with fission, you know this. But nuclear reactor se, fission se, if we produce thermal neutrons, there are some research reactors also and we use neutrons from those reactors to study material. So in India, in only at BARC, research reactor is present and you can study material properties using neutrons over there. So, uh, one example, please don't get bored, one example. Superconductor, these, these are going to be the game changers for the next generation. Why can any physics discipline student? Why? You know why? Because, ye zero electrical resistance dikhana, dikhata hai. Zero electrical resistance. That's the third. You understand what zero electrical resistance means? Wires with your transmission or light ka, if it resistance is zero, losses will be zero. Economy, you can, you now you 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 now up IAM wale wale log, isko bahut closely watch karenge. Because that will impact the economy of the country, of the world actually. Zero electrical losses, energy. So, but the mankind is in a pursuit to achieve this since 1911, but not achieved till date. What will it do? I'll quickly go through this slide. You can have superconducting uh, materials to power the train on the, on, the, on the track. Actually, China has already built a maglev train, a pro prototype of that. MRI machines, magnetic resonance imaging, those require superconducting magnets. And uh, particle accelerators. Those require superconducting magnets, superconducting cavities, which work on. Anybody has heard about this term? Do you remember the God particles? Which first was on a God particle? This is that machine which created the God particle. This is also a circular machine with circumference running around three countries in Europe. And India is a part of that. You should be proud of that. Bunch of you. So, and one other thing to proud for me personally because one of my colleagues only in U working in USA recently discovered a material which actually showed electrical resistance zero near the room temperature but the pressure was too high, around 200 gigapascal, not practical application. There are many other, other uh, stories in this direction like you, we want to make hydrogen a metal. This is the holy grail of every physicist. This is the holy grail of physics to make hydrogen metal. Alchemist study hai aap Da Vinci code padhi hai, you understand the holy grail. So this is the holy grail. We want to make hydrogen some metal. Someday. Another important aspect, mysteries of ice. Ice ko sabhi jaante hai, physics ho, chemistry ho, biology ho, koi isko dispute nahi karega. 
So whenever you have your next drink with a cube of ice, answer yourself a question. Is it a low temperature ice or a high pressure ice? You can make ice by contracting water molecules by freezing it, cooling it or by externally pressurizing it at room temperature. Then also you can make ice. What's the difference between these two ices? This is the second homework for you. Now if I'm talking about pressure, pressure has a very wide range in the universe. From very small pressure to intergalactic space to very high pressure in planetary interiors, stars interiors. Earth, by the way, lies here. Earth ke center mein kitna pressure hai aap sabas hai? Aapke upar ye saari building mein aapke sar pe laage rakhunga kitna pressure aap feel karenge. Then you, if I bury you down uh, on, on this earth crust, kitna pressure aap feel karenge. You go towards the center of the earth, the kind of pressure. All material properties are going to change. Everything is going to change. But even then, some uh, scientists have discovered that some life survives even at around 1 gig gigapascal, mean 10,000 atmosphere of pressure. That is in Marina Trench, around 11 kilometers down on, from the uh, level, uh, sea level. So if I if I'm speaking this, now this is a kind of a complex diagram. I brought a temperature here, pressure here. Means now you know the kind of temperature. 4 Kelvin means after agar liquid nitrogen liquid helium aap umi dal ke dubayenge aur aise karenge umi bahar aa jayenge. This is such a low temperature. Everything will freeze. And agar aap high pressure is equally dangerous. So pressure temperature range this we call as a physicist we call this a phase diagram. So you'll be surprised to listen this that water has more than 17 known structures at different pressure temperature ranges. 17 known. And as scientists we have reached up to nearly ice 10 phase, uske upar bhoat sari bhi discover honi baki hai. So, what a chemist view will be on this? Ye to wise ice water means a hydrogen bond. So it's a simple electronegativity problem. Hydrogen bond hai, udar ek plus minus, delta plus hoga, ek delta minus hoga and there will be something. So, jis is kaise dekhega usko? Simple, it's a double well potential. Kaise hai, mein abhi Double, we just solve the Schrodinger equation, everything will be answered. <laughs> Biologist, kya bolega? Proton, proton, if I remove the electron, which jo, uh, jo bond bana raha hai, to hydrogen is nothing but a proton. Many biological reactions are governed by, enzymatic reactions are governed by proton transfers. But the mechanism is not known. So, biologist bolega, jo, ye jo bhi ho raha hai, you take it to yourself, just tell me, will this proton motion improve my drug efficacy or not? Geologist kya bolega? Earth ke crust mein water ka transport kaise ho raha? It is all through minerals, through OH, dot to H2O, dot OH and all those kind of stuff. Woh mujhe batao. Astrophysicist, take everything, all the intellectual things to yourself. Let me know main Mars mission ka bhi jun to have extraterrestrial life. Likewise, pharma and everything. So one small problem, every branch of science uh, wants to benefit from that problem as you see this. Ye last slide hai. Ye kya hai? Physics ki discipline wale jane. Upar ek spring hai, do atom hai. This is a simple harmonic motion. Ek parabola hai. Simple harmonic motion ka ek parabola hai. Now real terms mein, ye parabola simple nahi hota hai because of some anharmonicity means it has some effects. Wo effects aane ke liye uh, the real situations mein it's not a simple, uh, symmetric situation. Now, I am showing this hydrogen bond ki situation here. In which this harmonic well, because of two atoms, ke ka ye well, well tha, abhi consider a couple. A couple is in which there is a big bonding, a good potential well is created. Now, a third person comes from somewhere and starts attracting one of those. So, this potential well will be a problem. If a other well will develop, he will try. Karega. This is called a double well potential. So, we talk about physics mein energy minimization ki baat karte hai, means everything will try to go to the minimum energy. Now a second local minimum is trying to develop over there. Now I try to push, I pressurize the temperature laga karke, to pure bond ko squeeze karne ki koshish karta. Jabardasti dono ko pass leta hai, lata hai, koi hota hai ko villains. So jabardasti pass lane ki koshish karta. Then this becomes a double well potential. Abhi pakke double well bange sabse upar. Abhi ye badi adhik si situation hai. Love triangle ki movies dekhi hai, aap komane. But in the situation. Now I try to last. I try to further push down this thing and go past. 
जब ये सिचुएशन आ जाएगी जब थर्ड फिगर है यहाँ पे तो गोविंदा वाली मूवी है जब हाइड्रोजन विल ट्राई टू विल इट विल बी वेरी मच डी लोकलाइज समाइम्स ये दिस साइड दैट साइड इन डिसऑर्डर्ड स्टेट एंड फाइनली दिस वेन हाइड्रोजन विल सिट एग्जैक्टली बिटवीन द टू ऑक्सीजन आइटम्स a mysterious situation scientists are trying to find out that situation and to me this is the krishna state because only krishna can remain stable or be with peace of mind in that state ye problem kitne log samjhe samajh aaye the so yeah very so this is a hydrogen structure hydrogen bond structure problem and with this i thank you very much Your emergency. Therefore, I invite Jayan Singh for introduction. <laughs> Good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to everyone present here today. My name is Jayan Singh from third year BSc Physics. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. He was awarded PhD in 2019 by Hobi Baba National Institute for his thesis work titled "Study of Vision Reaction." Involving weakly bonded object tangles. Uh, he he has published thirty eight papers in four international journals. His research interest lies in the field of nuclear reaction, nuclear structure, nuclear astrophysics, etc. He joined B A R C training school in twenty eleven. After completing M S C from I I T Kharagpur. After completing his uh, training program, he joined nuclear uh, division B A R C in twenty twelve. The topic for today will be some unsolved problems in physics. Personally speaking, sir, I'm really looking forward. So, without a further ado, uh, please allow me to welcome a uh, resource person for this afternoon, Dr. Asim Khan. Thank you for your kind nice introduction. So, uh, as we are running short of time, so I have to finish in next 10 minutes. So, in 10 minutes. I will tell you tell some uh, unsolved problems in physics. So I intend to cover these topics: fundamental forces and particles, and role of accelerators in unfolding the mystery of the universe. I will talk about some open problems in gravitational physics, uh, gravitational waves, and uh, neutrinos. And finally, I will talk about search for the missing mass of the universe. So you know. If I give you some object in your hand and then ask you to break again and again, so what you can find, you can find that it is made of some atoms. And if you further break it and you find that it is made of some electrons and uh, it is orbiting around some tiny things, very small nucleus. And again you further break it and you find that a nucleus is made of some protons and neutrons, right? And Again, you can break one proton, and you can find that it is made of some quarks and gluons and plasma. So these are the fundamental particles which constitute the whole universe. So there are basically, so far we know that there are six quarks and six leptons. So six quarks, so up, down, down, straight, top, and bottom quarks, and in leptons, so there are three charged leptons: electron, muon, tau, and associated three uh, neutrinos. So you know, whenever two such particles interact with each other, so basically they exchange something. So this is called force mediator. You know, depending upon the interactions and the particles which are interacting, so uh, if that force mediator is different. So far we know there are four kinds of uh, forces. So one is electromagnetic, strong force, weak force, and gravitational force. And you know that electromagnetic force is uh, uh, basically applicable in case of charges. And where photons is the charge carrier, and in case of strong forces, so basically quarks interacts via the strong forces, where gluons and Higgs boson act as the charge force carrier, and weak force is uh, uh, is act in the case of say weak interaction, uh, basically among fermions, and gravitational is well known, it acts in uh, between two masses, and you can compare the strength of these forces. You can scale that strong forces as a strength of strength forces one. So you can compare that. You can see that gravitational force is much more weaker than strong forces. So there are still open questions. So why is gravitational force so weak? And is there any existence of graviton? So we have detected so far photons, gluons, and so on. But the charge carrier for this gravitational force is so far undetected. And 
Why there are only four forces? Why not there are so there is fifth of fifth, sixth forces? And also we have broken these protons again and found that these are the fundamental particles. So then either, again there is a question whether we can again break this box. So these are some open problems. So and there is a huge role of particle accelerators in finding these discoveries. So basically what is particle accelerator do? So it is a uh, it tries to create a uh, earlier universe. So what a particle we basically break protons or any nuclear by particle accelerator. So what we do basically we collide two protons or two nucleus and we produce thousands or cores of particles and we detect such particles using such giant detectors. And you know it has some uh, so there are uh, worldwide there are various laboratories. So large hadron collider is uh, the largest particle detectors in there. And you know, we have achieved remarkable amount of success using this particle accelerator. So we have discovered that Higgs boson. So in last lecture it was that shown as what particle. And also we have produced many exotic particles and we have discovered what grows plasma and new prism matter by which an earlier universe consisted of. And there are many open problems like if you see a magnet, if you, you it has always two poles, right? It has north pole and south pole. Even if you try to break it, again that fragments will have two poles. So you cannot find a magnet with single pole. But recent theory is that you can create a particle with single pole. So using particle accelerators, we are trying to produce such kind of particles which is having single pole, either north pole or south pole. So again, in this universe, you know there is a dominance of matter, right? So if you say bring together a positron and an electron, what will it do? It will just simply annihilate. So matter and antimatter cannot coexist together. So there is a dominance of matter over antimatter in this universe. So why is it so? So particle physicists are trying to find these answers. And so far we know that proton is a stable particle. But recent theory says that it is not stable. It can even decay by positron and some other particles. So these are the some open problems uh, in this. So in our country, we don't have a high energy particle accelerator, but we are uh, fortunate to have few uh, low energy particle accelerators. Among them, DRC PFR electron facility is one of them, where we can accelerate proton uh, ion up to uh, calcium and energy up to, it is not very high, but up to order of 10 mg per nuclear. And using such accelerator, you can study nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, nuclear nuclear interaction, nuclear structure, etc. Now, in recent times, so we have interest to study nuclear astrophysics. Basically, we want to understand what is going on inside the stars. So you know that how stars uh, uh, huge amount of uh, energy is generated inside stars. So because of nuclear reactions are continuously taking place inside the stars. And you know. In stars, the energy of the is required is 0.2 MeV per nuclear energy. It is even lower than the energy of whatever we are producing at our low energy accelerators. Yeah. So uh, basically, for that study, we need to have low energy high current accelerator, which is coming up in the near future. And also, we have uh, recent interest to extend our periodic tables. So just by fusing two atoms. So if you fuse two atoms with say atomic number J1 and J2, so it will produce a bigger and bigger atom, say with more atomic number J1 plus J2. But such kind of, so so far we have extended the table up to J2 to 180, but that kind of measurement is very, very challenging. It can even take one month to synthesize one bigger and bigger atom. So now I am coming to the some problems with neutrinos. You know, uh, neutrinos is a particle which is produced in the beta decay of neutrons. Uh, so you know that even if you are sitting here, so 100 trillions of neutrons is passing through your body every second. So this is so important particles. Yeah. So what we know about neutrinos, this, this is massless, it interacts by weak force and it is electrically neutral and there are three flavors of neutrinos and there are many more open questions so far. Uh, and it is postulated that neutrinos is not exactly massless, it is having some mass. So it can tell uh, some physics beyond standard model and there are many more new flavors. So that neutrino is not of only basic interest, you can 
uh, use that solar neutrino for probing the sun and also for uh, monitoring the neutrino uh, flux inside this air vehicle. Now, I am coming to the dark matter. So, okay, so I will skip this slide. So, you have heard about this gravitational wave detection. So, this is basically just uh, testing of Einstein's theory of relativity. You have uh, recently you have uh, uh, seen that we have detected gravitational wave. So gravitational wave is generated which is uh, basically when two stars orbit each other and using uh, such laser interferometer experiments you can detect this gravitational wave. I am not going into detail. So and uh, recently so there are many open questions right now. So basically so far we have not detected gravitational wave uh, through a direct experiment and uh, we are yet to explore the unseen universe by detecting gravitational waves. And you know LIGO India coming up for answering those questions. So you may wonder, so basically what we will do with these subatomic particles? So the same question was faced by Sir J.G. Thompson. So one gentleman asked, uh, what will you do with such invisible particles, with electrons? Thompson replied, one day you will pay tax for this electron. So you know that all of us are paying electricity in our So, always you should remember that today's science, fundamental science is tomorrow's technology. So, with this, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Good afternoon to one and all. I, Satvik Singh, a student of TYBSE Botany, would like to propose my sincere vote of thanks on this special day of scientific lecture series of HBNI DAE program, which was an initiated between Wilson College and Homi Baba National Institute, Mumbai. First of all, I would like to thank the management of Wilson College and our beloved principal, Professor APJ AP Nikalje, for initiating and supporting this program. I would like to appreciate the sincere efforts and the meticulously planned lecture series by the scientists of Humi, Culture, Humi Baba National Institute from Biological, Chemical and Physical Sciences. These sessions will definitely be useful to the students to plan their careers or higher studies in the future. I pay my sincere thanks to all the esteemed resource persons and the entire team. I would like to thank the Vice Presidents of Wilson College, Dr. Harsha Bhatkar, Dr. Ajita Kumar and Ms. Vinita Matthew and the IQSE Coordinator, Dr. Radhika Birnod. I thank all the HODs and teachers of Science Department and the Convener of Student Council, Dr. Jaya Knox, for supporting this event to happen successfully. This event was coordinated by a team of students, volunteers, who worked throughout the program. I would like to thank all of them. I would like to thank all my student friends who participated in this program and making it successful. Last but not the least, I would like to thank support staff, admin staff, technical staff and the canteen staff for the contribution towards this program. Thanks one and all. Have a good day. Thank you.